reading from the Guardians of Childhood, Book 2, E. Aster Bunnymund and the Warrior Eggs at the Earth's Core, by William Joyce. Before Chapter 1, a recap, a prelude, and a premonition of terror. Since the Battle of the Nightmare King had been won, the planet seemed relatively quiet. Catherine, North, and Ombrick had stayed in the Himalayas with the Lunar Lamas. They knew Pitch and his nightmare armies would strike again. Pitch had been wearing the robot's Jin suit of armor and had vowed revenge against them all. But the Man in the Moon had given North the magic sword that had belonged to his father. He had told them of the four other relics from the Golden Age that could be helpful perhaps essential, in defeating the Nightmare King, once and for all. But where Pitch was hiding, or what they should do next, was a puzzlement. Similar questions were being pondered on a faraway island, in a secluded section of the Pacific Ocean. On this island, there resided the most ancient, mysterious, and peculiar creature the world had ever known, or not known, actually. Though he had possessed extraordinary wisdom and power, he had given up on the comings and goings of history and humans. He had not allowed himself to be seen in living memory. This being, however, knew something was in the air. He knew about the Battle of the Nightmare King, and he knew of Ombrick and Pitch. He'd had dealings with them in the distant past. He could see and sense signs most unwelcome. Deeth Deep beneath the earth, which was his realm, he heard ominous sounds. He kept them himself and liked it that way, but his animal instincts told him that, like it or not, he would once again be asked to help save the world he had so carefully cut himself off from. His nose twitched, his massive ears flinched. He wondered about the terrible battles to come and what, if any, part he would decide to play. Chapter 1. We begin our story with a story. In the hinterlands of eastern Siberia was the village where Catherine, North, and Ombrick called home. The village of Santoff Clausen felt somewhat lonely without them, but a dozen or so adventurous children played in the enchanted forest that protected their homes from the outside world. The surrounding oak trees were among the largest in the world. Their massive trunks and limbs were a paradise for climbing. Petter, a strong boy of twelve who imagined himself a daring hero, catapulted onto the porch of his favorite treehouse. He landed just ahead of his little sister Sasha. She was testing her latest invention, gloves and shoes that allowed her to scamper up a tree like a squirrel. But Petter's catapult was faster. I'll beat you next time, Sasha said hoping that a small engine on the heel of each shoe would do the trick. She peered down at the clearing hundreds of feet below. The village's bear, a massive creature, lopped around the perimeter of the clearing alongside Petrov, the horse of Nicholas St. North. Sasha was wondering if she'd ever be allowed to ride Petrov when she spied tall William, the first son of old William, squatting on his heels, talking to a group of centipedes. The children of Santoff Clausen had begun to learn the easier insect languages, ant, worm, snail, but tall William was the first to tackle the more difficult speech of centipede. Sasha pressed a trumpet-shaped sound amplifier to her ear. Tall William reported what the centipede said, that all was well, Pitch, the Nightmare King, was nowhere to be seen. It was a warm summer day, but the memory of that terrible time when Pitch appeared in Santa Clausen made Sasha shiver as if it was the darkest night in deepest winter. Pitch had once been a hero of the Golden Age, an ancient time when constellations ruled the universe. His name in those days long ago was General Cosmosis Pitchinger and he had led the Golden Age armies in capturing the fearlings and dream pirates who plagued the era. These villains were wily creatures of darkness. When they escaped, they devoured the general's soul, 
and from that moment on, he hungered for the dreams of innocent children and was known simply as Pitch. He was determined to drain the good from dreams until they were nightmares, every last one of them, so that the children of Earth and then other worlds would live in terror. And the dreams of the children of Santa Clausen, who had never before known fear or wickedness, were the prizes he coveted most. Sasha, like the other children of Santa Clausen, had survived that terrifying night when Pitch's fearlings had nearly captured them in the enchanted forest. Thanks to a glimmering boy with a moonlit staff who drove back the inky marauders. Now she climbed out onto a branch and hung by her knees, still holding the ear trumpet. The world looks different upside down, but it sounds the same, she thought. Sasha listened once more, then lowered the sound amplifier. The insects had said all was well. Even so, what if Pitch and his feelings come back again? She frowned, but before the thought could darken her mood, Petter called out for a new contest. Race you to the clearing, he shouted, leaping from the nearest branch. Scrambling down the tree, Sasha's shoes and gloves now gave her the advantage. She landed proudly in front of tall William and his brother, William the almost youngest. Her own brother was still half a tree behind. She was about to brag about her victory when she spotted the stone elves hunkered among the vines and trees. There were at least ten statues in total, and they made for an eerie and unsettling sight some with arms raised, swords at the ready, others frozen in mid-scream. They were Nicholas St. North's band of outlaws, turned to stone by the spirit of the forest. The spirit had spared North, for he alone was true of heart. Rejecting her offer of riches, he had gone to the village's rescue when Pitch attacked again. He then decided to stay in Santa Clausen and became their wizard, Ombrick Shalazar's apprentice. The spirit of the forest was just one of the magical barriers their wizard had devised to protect the village when he first created it. He'd also conjured up a hundred-foot-tall hedge, the great black bear the size of a house, and the majestic oaks that blocked the advance of anyone who tried to enter Santoff Clausen with ill intent. But none of these had been able to protect the children from the shadows and feelings at Pitch's command. Petter and his friend Fogg, had begun crossing stick swords with each other, acting out the battle that took place when Nicholas St. North had come face to face with Pitch. Everything they knew and loved had seemed lost until North had galloped up to the rescue on Petrov. Though badly wounded, North had been able to drive Pitch away, but the children all worried that the Nightmare King would return. At this very moment, Ombrick North and their friend Catherine were far from Santoff Clausen, searching for the weapon, some sort of relic that would conquer Pitch forever. The youngest William was near tears. I'm afraid. Pitch told us he would come back. North, Ombrick, and Catherine will find a way to stop him, Petter told him reassuringly. William, the absolute youngest, wasn't entirely convinced. But Pitch's magic is strong. What if it's stronger than Ombrick's? What does Ombrick always say? Petter asked. The youngest William thought for a moment. Then his eyes grew bright. Magic's real power is in believing, he proclaimed, clearly pleased to have remembered Ombrick's very first lesson. And then he began to chant, I believe, I believe, I believe. Sasha joined in. I believe, I believe, I believe Catherine and North and Ombrick will come home. Chapter 2, in which old friends are reunited. While William, the absolute youngest, and Sasha chanted, the light around the children began to glisten and shine. The spirit of the forest was coming. In a whirl of shimmering veils laced with tiny gemstones, she appeared before them. Time for lessons, she whispered, her soothing voice cheering the children as always and her luminous, otherworldly beauty banished all worries. Today, you have a special surprise. Lessons in Santoff Clausen were always a surprise. On any given day, the children might learn how to build a bridge to the clouds 
or how to make rain come from a river rock. So if the spirit of the forest said this surprise was special, it must be amazing indeed. The children broke into a run towards the village, with Petrov and the bear galloping beside them. The spirit of the forest glided above them, enveloping the children with trails of light that tickled and swirled around them. They paused only to stomp on the rift in the ground where Pitch had disappeared when he'd retreated. William, the absolute youngest, stomped the hardest of all. Lessons took place inside Ombrick's home in Big Root, the oldest tree in the village and the center of its magic. The huge branches swayed and waved as the children dashed up its massive roots and into the hollow. Ever since Ombrick had set off on his mission with North and Catherine, the children's parents had been helping them with their lessons. But on this day, there was a surprise indeed. A towering stack of packages, all identical, cluttered Ombrick's library. There were so many that the bees, spiders, and ants who kept Ombrick's workroom tidy couldn't keep up with them. In charge of the library was Mr. Quirty, a glowworm who loved books above all other things. He could generally be found meandering up the spine of one book or down another, cleaning the covers or repairing torn pages. Roughly six inches long, he was a bright, spring-like shade of green and had quite a number of legs, and wore small round glasses perched on his nose. He was also the ultimate authority when Ulrich was away. He had wriggled down from the book stacks to oversee the package deliveries. Careful now, he told them in a surprisingly human-like voice. He was the only insect in the known world who spoke human languages. Of course, the children examined the presents with keen interest. They look like North's work, said Fogg. The comment caused a wave of excited chatter. Then they noticed a small army of ants hauling a package larger than the others through Big Root's entrance. I wonder who that one is for, said William, the absolute youngest, a hint of hopefulness in his voice. Are there any labels? Sasha asked. Just then, the giant globe in the center of the room, the one that Ombrick slept in, swung open. The inside was hollow except for a single wooden rod near the bottom which Ombrick stood on to sleep. The children always wondered how he managed to not fall off, but apparently, for wizards, this was normal. As always, the dozen or so owls sat on their perches, uh, perches around the globe. They had the singular ability to communicate with the wizard with their minds. The owls spent a good portion of their day preening, but now they began to hoot, slowly and deeply. At the center of the globe, a flat, circular glass plate appeared and started to glow. An illuminated image shimmered across it, and a familiar face came into focus. The children cried out happily, Omrik! It was Omrik! It had been weeks and weeks since he'd left, and questions tumbled out in shouts. Where are you? And how is Catherine? And especially, whose presents are these? The old wizard held up his hands. First things first, he said with a laugh. Tell me, has anyone had a nightmare? The children looked from one another, shaking their heads. No, said Fogg. Old William had his birthday, Petter asked. So did William, the absolute youngest, Sasha reported. We're still the youngest and the oldest in the village, the youngest William pipped up. Even when I have a birthday, I'm still the littlest, he concluded with a frown. Then everything is as it was and as it should be, Ombrick said with a satisfied nod. I knew everything would be in order in the capable hands of Mr. Query. Upon hearing Ombrick mention his name, Mr. Query momentarily stopped reselling the binding of Interesting Unexplainables of Atlantis Volume 8 and gave them all a wave. Tall William, Ombrick said, signaling to the boy. I do believe you've gotten seven-eighths of an inch taller. Tall William sat up a little straighter, a pleased smile on his face. Sasha, I hear you've figured out how to climb trees faster than a squirrel. Sasha raised her feet and hands so that Ombre could see her invention. Ingenious, he said, stroking his beard. 
for every child he had a cheering observation or a bit of praise or encouragement. Finally, he reached William, the absolute youngest, who only wanted to know more about the mysterious boxes. Omber could tell it was taking every ounce of the boy's self-control not to snatch one up. To answer your question, young William, these boxes are presents from North. There is one for each of you. Each is exactly the same until you pick it up, he said mysteriously. Since I'm the smallest, may I have the largest box? said the youngest William in his sweetest voice. That gift is special, said Ombrick. It's for all of you and should be opened last. So each child chose one of the other boxes. Petter hefted one in his hand. It was surprisingly light. Now think of a thing you would like and it will be yours. Petter closed his eyes and thought this very hard. When he opened them, instead of a box in his hands, there was a pair of special shoes that would allow him to glide over water. William, the absolute youngest, found a small mechanical soldier that could move on its own. It carried two swords, which it waved wildly. It's just as I daydreamed, the youngest William cried. Tell North thanks. There were even presents for Petrov, a carrot that would last a week, and the bear, an elegant ring for the paw that had been hurt in the battle with Pitch. When all the wishes had been granted, the children turned to the larger box. That one is from Catherine, Ombrick told them. The ants carried over the oversized package to Ombrick's cluttered desk. As they set it down, the package began to unfold on its own and came out a book. Catherine has written a story about our adventures since we left you. She misses you all and wishes she could tell you in person. But until then, her book will tell you the story. Now, wait, before we start, we must begin with the first spell I ever taught you. Do you remember? Umbrick asked. The children glanced at one another, grinning. Did they remember? Why, Sasha and the youngest William had just said that spell in the forest. Pleased to be a step ahead from their teacher for once, they began to murmur. As the words, I believe, I believe, I believe, filled the air, the green cover of Catherine's book opened with a contented sigh of a brand new story entering the world. The pages turned, stopping to reveal a delicate drawing of Catherine. A gold ribbon marked the page, and at the top, in Catherine's crisp handwriting, were the words, The Beginning. Chapter 3 Catherine's Story of Their Recent Amazements To the children's surprise, the drawing of Catherine began to move and talk, and then her voice filled the room. The insects stopped their tidying, and the owls quieted their hooting. Mr. Query paused in his work on the other books. The only other movement in Big Root came from the turning of the pages and the fluttering of wings of the moths and butterflies that cooled the children against the summer heat. Standing watch outside, Petrov and the bear leaned forward to listen to, for even a horse and a bear love a good story. Did you also get a present? William, the absolute youngest, asked the Catherine drawing. If you didn't, I'll share mine with you when you get home. I got a wonderful present, Catherine assured him. It's all part of the story. And so she began, the pages of the book turning as she talked. Do you remember how Pitch disappeared into the ground to escape the sunlight? The children all nodded. Light was the one thing that Pitch could not stand. And remember how North made the mechanical gin? The children nodded again. Good. Now I will tell you what became of the gin. The children leaned in closer, unable to take their eyes from the drawings as Catherine filled them in on what happened the last several weeks. Pitch had possessed the djinn disguised as a spider, and he had learned Ombrick's spells of enslavement. He'd turned Ombrick and North into porcelain toys and was going to destroy them. But the spectral boy named Nightlight saved us all. The children gasped at this news. Petrov whinnied. Even the butterflies stopped fluttering. Nightlight is a great hero, Catherine said, her face beaming. 
He was once the protector of the man in the moon, and he kept Pitch trapped for centuries. He is fearless and powerful, and now he's our friend and protector. The children looked at one another, eyes wide. Nightlight and I found Ombrick and North in the high Himalayas, the tallest mountains in the world. But since Pitch had gotten inside the gin's metal shell, no light could get through to him, and he was practically invincible. He'd gathered a huge army of fearlings. There was a terrible battle, and all hope seemed lost. Then, then, Nightlight brought his own army to help us. What kind of army? Pieter had to ask. Catherine grinned. Moonbeams, and the lunar llamas sent abominable snowmen. You know, the one Ombrick had always talked about? They're real, and as big as our bear, and there's hundreds of them. They're actually called yetis. The children cheered as Catherine's drawings showed scene after scene of the battle. Then the pages paused at a sketch of Catherine, Ombrick, and North as they stood within a sort of castle. Where is that? Sasha asked. Ah, that is the Luna Lamagery. It was built by the Lunar Lamas. They're the holy men, older than even Ombrick. The next drawing showed Ombrick, North, and Catherine, surrounded by yetis and lunar llamas. Then the page turned, and there was a drawing of the kindest-looking face they had ever seen. "'Who is that?' asked Fogg. "'He is the man in the moon,' Catherine told him. The children murmured amongst themselves, "'The man in the moon!' The man in the moon told us Pitch had crashed to earth, and it was Nightlight who trapped him deep underground for all those centuries when he disappeared, Catherine recounted. The man in the moon told us that now Pitch has returned, he will never stop, and he asked if we would join in the war to destroy Pitch forever. So there will be more battles, William the almost youngest gulped. Does that mean we won't see you for a long time? asked Fogg. When are you coming home? We miss you, Sasha added. The children's questions and Catherine's answers were drowned out by a loud honking noise. Catherine began to last. I'll tell you more later. I have my baby goose to take care of. A drawing of a very large gosling appeared on the page. William, the absolute youngest, jumped closer for a better look. Is that your present? Yes. Her name is Kalash. She's a Himalayan snow goose and she's going to grow as big as a horse. She thinks I'm her mother, but tonight at bedtime, my book will tell you all about her, I promise. Then the book slowly closed itself, and the children were left with the impossible task of having to wait till bedtime to hear the rest of the story. Yet they were children of Santoff Clausen. Mischief and magic would speed their day. But for a glowworm named Mr. Query, there could not be enough time. Of all the books in Ombrick's library, Catherine's was the most amazing. He would spend the rest of the day polishing it till it shined like a jewel. Chapter 4 A Short Frolic Across the Planet Meanwhile, far away in the highest Himalayas, Catherine sat at one of the moon-shaped tables in the library of the Lunar Lamagery. It was there that the Grand High Lama had taught her how to make magic sketchbooks. How, if she thought hard enough, the drawings and the words she wrote could come to life on the page. The ink and paper she used were ordinary, but her mind, her imagination, was what gave the words and pictures their great power. The power to connect her to anyone who read her stories. This was the first time she had tried to contact her friends through one of these charmed books, and she was thrilled by how well it had worked. It was as if she was right there in Ombrick's library, sitting next to the youngest William and the others, but it also made her miss her friends even more. Nightlight sat perched on one of the library chairs, also listening to Catherine's story. He especially liked the parts about himself. Catherine was never happier than when Nightlight was nearby. Though he never uttered a word, they had become very close. He was a miraculous friend. He could fly and speak to moonbeams with his mind, 
He made her laugh and always kept her safe. But it was in this nearly silent times that the real strength of their bond was evident. A friend who understands everything without being told is the rarest and best kind of friend. So this evening, without Catherine having to say a word, Nightlight could tell that she missed the children back in Santa Clausen and worried for their safety. While Catherine fed her gosling, a process that involved several yetis and an astonishing amount of oatmeal, Nightlife set off for Santa Clausen to make sure the children were safe. Catherine didn't see him leave, but she knew that he had left. This was the time of day when he would fly across the world to check for signs of pitch. Nightlight's life was divided into three parts. First, there was his time as guardian and protector of the little man in the moon, a time he could barely remember. He did not like to think about the second part. His long, dark years trapped in a cave with the Nightmare King, locked inside Pitch's cold heart. The third part of Nightlight's life was the present, the time of freedom and friendship. This part of his life was happier than any time he could remember. Whenever he le leapt onto a breeze or, or a cloud or helped guard the children, he felt brave and strong and bright. What made him happier still was Catherine. She was clever and kind and always ready to help her friends. And because Santa Clausen was Catherine's home and was special to her, Nightlight checked the village extra carefully on his nightly patrols. If Pitch returned to hurt these people, Catherine's people, Nightlight would do everything in his power to stop him. Even at the risk of being imprisoned again inside Pitch's heart, or even worse, destroyed. It was night when he arrived in Santa Clausen. He scoured the forest, looking for danger. Was that the silhouette of a leaf in the moonlight, or the grasping fingers of a fearling? Was it Pitch who momentarily blocked out the moon, or a cloud drifting across the night sky? After Nightlight had examined every out-of-the-way crook and corner of the forest and was assured that all was well, he moved on to the village. He peered into each cottage and yard. He even checked the layers of ground around Big Root. Finally, he held his moonlit staff over the dank, smoky scar in the dirt where Pitch had retreated. The moonbeam in his staff's diamond tip glowed brightly, and Nightlight was able to see that the scar looked just as it had the night before, and the night before that. He checked a second time just to be sure, but he saw no dastardly fearlings disguised as shadows, no trace of pitch anywhere. On most nights, this was enough to satisfy the spectral boy. He would laugh his perfect laugh and hop onto the nearest cloud for a game of moonbeam tag. But tonight, something felt wrong. Perhaps it was nothing but all those years near Pitch had given him an instinct for evil. So he stayed back in the shadows, searching the sky as the children of Santa Clausen made their way to Big Root for their bedtime story. By now he knew their names, Sasha, Petter, Fogg, all the Williams, and the others. He watched them secretly while they talked about the story Catherine would continue to tell them tonight. As they hurried to prepare for bed, the Nightmare King was far from their minds. But as much as Nightlight loved Catherine's stories, he would be watchful. While the children gathered, his attention was on the shadows. Chapter 5 A Bedtime Story with a Girl, a Goose, and Snowmen Who Were Not So Abominable As the children of Santa Clausen tumbled into Big Root that evening, bunk beds materialized from the tree's hollow center. Each row, fanning out like the spokes of a giant wheel, was stacked five beds high. Twisting up and down the center was a spiral staircase. William, the absolute youngest, scrambled up the stairs and was the first to reach his bed. He propped up his metal soldier against the pillow so he could see Catherine's book while still suspended from the ceiling by a strand of Sir Quarry's silk. In another moment, the rest of the children had found their bunks. Warm cocoa hovered in the air by each bed. Cookies also appeared. The children sipped and snacked and waited for Catherine's story to start again. She's going to tell us about the giant baby goose, 
Sasha said. And Nightlight, William the absolute youngest added, he's my favorite. Nightlight hovered outside, moved closer to the window at the sound of his name. Though worry still nagged him, Petrov and the bear stood watch by the door, so Nightlight allowed himself to relax. He pressed his face against the glass, just in time to see Catherine's book reopen. As it had that afternoon, Catherine's voice filled Big Root. The pages turned and the story started again. Tonight I'm going to tell you about my gosling, Catherine's voice began. The tale of the baby snow goose is sad, Sasha immediately protested. I don't like sad stories. It only begins sadly, Catherine assured her. Satisfied, Sasha leaned back against her pillow. A moth settled beside her, and together they watched the pages stop at a drawing of a giant pile of snow and ice. After the battle, Pitch had retreated inside the djinn's body, Catherine's drawing told them. But as he left, he caused an avalanche that buried the nests of the giant snow geese. The children oohed as the pages turned to a sketch of one of the enormous birds. Catherine explained how she helped dig them out, a most beautiful silvery egg that had been buried in the snow. The parents could not be found, Catherine said sadly. Then she paused. The children of Santa Clausen all knew the story of Catherine's parents. They too had perished in a blizzard when Catherine was just a baby. So it was no surprise to the children that Catherine's heart went out to the orphaned gosling. We looked closer at the egg, Catherine told them. It shuddered, and we heard a tiny tapping sound. A small hole appeared, and then a little orange beak pecked through the shell, and then a white feathered head pushed its way out. A picture of the baby goose, half in and half out of the shell, appeared before them. I wish you could feel how soft her feathers are. Maybe I'll be able to bring her home. I named her Kalash. That's the name of the smallest mountain in the Himalayas. Kalash, repeated Sasha. I like that name. Nightlight and I helped the geese rebuild their nests. They're enormous, nearly as big as a room. And the geese stand taller than north. And they are big enough for a person to ride upon. Ombrek laughs every time he sees Kalash waddling behind me, Catherine continues. I think he feels like a grandfather. We filled the nests with white goose down to make warm beds. Sometimes I even sleep with Kalish so she won't feel lonely. But I'm very glad the Yetis know how to cook baby snow goose food. Pictures of the giant hairy Yetis cooking for the gosling and of Kalish waddling behind Catherine made everyone laugh. Then more images followed as the book's pages turned. Catherine and Nightlight flapping their arms to try to teach the gosling to fly, and Kalish's first hops into the sky. Now she can fly for two or three hours at a time, Catherine announced proudly. She's growing so fast, we keep having to make her nest bigger. She grows two or three inches a day. A growth chart appeared, measuring Kalish against a wall. And I'm learning to speak snow goose. It's almost as hard as owl, but easier than eagle. Now Fog sat forward. Can Nightlight speak to Snow Goose? He asked. Catherine answered. He never says a word, but seems to understand everything. With many creatures, I think he can talk just by thinking. But he likes to talk to me with pictures. Look. The children all leaned forward to see Nightlight's drawings, which were different from Catherine's. Simpler and more childlike, but quite beautiful in their own way. There were pictures showing his old life in the Golden Age. Pictures of the giant lunar moths, huge glowworms that lived on the moon, the man in the moon when he was a baby, and the last battle of the Golden Age. There was also a darker picture of all those years Nightlight was trapped in a cave with pitch. Finally, there was a picture of him being freed by his moonbeam friend, and then another of him saving the children of Santa of Clausen from the fearlings that night in the forest. Nightlight pressed his fingers against the glass. He loved seeing the children's reactions to his drawings. Yesterday morning, Nightlight had a surprise for me, Catherine said when the children settled back into the pillows. I'd been waiting and waiting for Kalish to be big enough to ride, and secretly, Nightlight and Kalish had decided that it was the day. 
Kalish nudged my arm with her beak and lowered herself so that I could climb onto her back. So I did. She unfolded her beautiful wings and we took to the air. It felt as if we could fly forever. We flew all over the Himalayas, even the tallest mountain in the world, and of course we flew over the mountain Kalish was named for. We flew until it was dark, and then I tucked Kalish into her nest and told her a bedtime story about all of you until she fell asleep. And now it's time for all of us to do the same. The book began to close. Good night, everyone. Dream of Kalish and me, and we will come home to see you soon. The story had ended happily as Catherine had promised. William, the absolute youngest, yawned and rolled over with a quiet snore. Sasha kicked off her covers and a troop of beetles pulled them back up over her shoulders. Petter was soon dreaming about giant geese and abominable snowmen. Catherine hadn't told her friends that North and Umbrick were trying to discover where the other relics from the moon were hidden. She hadn't told them that the Nightmare King had vowed to turn her into a fearling princess and to make nightmares real. Those things scared her, and she knew they'd scare her friends too. Besides, she was sure Nightlight would be keep watching over them. Nightlight, who never slept, who never dreamed, would keep nightmares both imagined and real away. Petrov and the bear stood watch at Big Root's entrance while Nightlight sat just outside the window. His guard was up. The night was too still. Something was wrong. Something was coming. Chapter 6. Amazing Discoveries in Ancient Magic While Catherine was telling her bedtime story, North was studying the sword the man in the mood had bestowed upon him. He knew he was in a race against time. Pitch would return, and when he did, Nicholas St. North wanted to be ready. He prided himself on being the best swordsman in the world. Indeed, in his bandit days, he'd once defeated an entire cavalry regiment with nothing more than a bent steak knife. But this sword was blasted confounding. Etched on its handle in a clear, handsome script was the name Sar Lunar the Eleventh. The man in the moon's father had been the last Tsar, or ruler, of the Golden Age and his sword had been crafted with more care than even North himself was capable of. North had hammered out many a fine weapon, even some forged from bits of ancient meteor, but nothing like this amazing blade. It never seemed heavy, no matter how long North practiced with it. Its hilt closed tightly around his hand when he began to wield it, then loosened when he was ready to put it away. It could slice through whole boulders in half with one slash, it wasn't a sword for slaying your average enemy, that was certain. But he wanted, needed, to understand all its hidden powers. How else would he make the best use of it, especially against pitch? The yetis did what they could to help. The crafty warriors possessed an amazing arsenal of arrow guns, pikes, bludgeons, spears, dirks, knucklers, and daggers, and they used them all against this amazing sword. North was victorious every time, but it wasn't always his skill that won the day. It was the blade itself. The sword had a mind of its own. It would leap from its sheath and into North's hand whenever there was danger, even during the friendly pretend attacks of the Yetis. It seemed to guide him to block an opponent's every strike. This piqued North's pride. The sound of him yelling, Quit that! I'm the best swordsman who ever breathed air! and do what I say, you ancient pile of stardust, could often be heard echoing through the lamagerie during sword practice. That morning, in a practice battle with Yalu, the fierce and friendly leader of the Yetis, North vanquished the hairy giant easily, and Yalu carried the most feared of all Yeti weapons, an abominable mood swing. Yalu didn't seem to mind, but North was starting to feel sorry for him, You'll get me next time, North said with a good-natured chuckle. As he reached up to shake hands with Yellow, the sword flew from his grasp. It appeared determined to fall from the tower. North grabbed wildly for it, but it was too quick. He and Yellow looked down in horror. Tashi, 
one of Yalu's lieutenants, was just below, with the Grand High Lama. They were both standing on their heads, meditating. The sword was heading straight for them. What does one shout to a meditating yeti and an ancient moon monk when a magic sword is about to impale them? North wondered fleetingly. Get off your heads before you lose them, he bellowed. Then, a remarkable thing happened. As the weapon neared them, it stopped its fall. It hovered in the air for a moment, then began to rise. North reached out, his hand beginning to tingle. And even though the sword was a hundred feet below, it instantly flew back to him and slapped into his palm with a satisfying thwack. Down below, Tashi and the Grand High Lama remained in their headstands, completely unaware of their near demise. North turned the weapon over and over in wonder. The sword had fallen on purpose to show him one of its secrets, that it could change direction to avoid causing harm. So he tried to test his sharpness with his thumb, but the sword's tip pulled away. Can the sword wound only my enemies? he asked out loud. Yalu motioned for him to try to slice him. North paused, but Yalu was adamant. So North took a breath and then slashed the braid directly towards Yalu. The Yeti didn't flinch, and once again, the sword veered off, refusing to cause harm. The blasted thing! I expect a sword to do what I want. Why give me a weapon that fights against me? North fumed. The Yeti eyed North with an amused expression. Perhaps the weapon is fighting for you, he suggested. That pleased North. He was nodding in agreement when he heard a quiet ahem behind him. North turned. Ombrick stood there. He seemed eager to talk. I've been working on something that might help us, the wizard said, as if picking up from a prior conversation, one that had nothing to do with North's sword. North saw great excitement in the wizard's eyes. Ombrick had already discovered that the llamas had a magnificent clock that recorded every second of time. It was one of the few possessions the llamas had been able to bring back to Earth before Pit destroyed their home planet. They told Ombrick the clock was as old as time itself, and it could send its user back a day, a year, or even an eon. The wizard had been relentlessly studying the great round clock. He couldn't believe that he, the prince of invention, had never tried to create such a marvel himself. The clock more than 30 feet high, looked like nothing he had ever seen before. It was made up of dozens of interlocking rings that spun and rotated inside one another. The rings were formed from a pale metal known only to the llama's home planet, and in the center stood a column of round clock faces of various sizes. These were used to set the clock to the exact time and place in history to which one wanted to journey. With some trial and error, Ombrick had learned how to go on short visits into the past. No matter how much time he actually spent in the past, he returned to the present within minutes of when he left. Everyone in the Lamadry got used to seeing him pop up out of nowhere with fantastical tales of his adventures. One day, he told Catherine he went to see the Great Pyramid of Giza being built. Good thing they'd learned to levitate solid rock back then, or they would have never finished the thing, the wizard declared. Odd, though, that it was once topped with an egg-shaped stone. After another journey, he landed in the middle of the courtyard at the Lamadry, red-faced and panting, a large tear in his robe. North had never seen the wizard so out of sorts. What's wrong, old man? he asked. Most dinosaurs are really very friendly creatures, Umbrick answered once he caught his breath. But those Rex fellows, Tyrannosaurus, a bit snappy when hungry. All of these journeys back and forth through time made for interesting stories, but North didn't see how they could help them defeat Pitch. But this time, North planned to do more than merely go back in time. I'm going to travel back to the moment when Pitch attacked the moon, he told North. I'll be able to see exactly where the relics fell. Finding them is our best hope of defeating him. 
and off he went. But on this trip, something unusual, baffling even, occurred. Ombrick was very disturbed as he told him of his latest adventure. They were eating supper in the busy dining hall of the Lamadry. Yetis, llamas, and snow geese ate noisily as he relented what had happened. I was back in time, just before the last battle of the Golden Age, he told them. I could see Pitch's ship hiding on the dark side of the earth, lying in wait to attack the moon. Suddenly, it occurred to me to warn the man in the moon and his family. I hoped to stop this whole history before it could even begin. But I sensed someone standing next to me. I turned to look, and there, to my utter amazement, floating beside me, was a most curious fellow. He was at least seven feet tall, wearing robes of a most peculiar design, and holding a long staff with an egg-shaped jewel at one end. Who was he? Did he say anything? asked Catherine. He did indeed, confirmed the wizard. One word, which he repeated. Naughty, naughty. Is that it? North demanded, lowering his soup spoon. Not quite, explained Ombrick. He touched my shoulder with the jeweled egg, and I suddenly found myself back here. You've told me of many strange things, Ombrick, but this takes the soup, said North, sipping again at his dinner. I left out perhaps the strangest part, added the wizard ominously. The fellow's ears. Yes, said North. Ombrick leaned forward. Mr. North, he said with a dramatic relish, they were the ears of a giant rabbit. Chapter 7. A Tall Tale for a Rabbit Catherine and North simply did not know what to say about a seven-foot-tall talking rabbit. They'd seen so many amazements with the great wizard, but this struck them as, well, outstandingly odd. North was the first to voice his doubts. An interstellar talking rabbit man, he questioned. Are you sure all this time travel isn't scrambling your brains? Ombrick raised an eyebrow at his former pupil. It does sound, hmm, very unusual, added Catherine. Ombrick's eyebrows rose even higher. He was stunned that they doubted him. His temper began to rise. Then his mustache began to twist in tight curls. But then Ombrick remembered that he, too, had doubted the existence of this rabbit when he'd first read about them in an ancient text from Atlantis. In fact, he discounted the creature as merely a myth until he saw it floating next to him. "'If I'm not mistaken,' began the wizard in his most patient teacher voice, "'this rabbit man, as you call him, is a puka, the rarest and most mysterious creature in the universe.'" North and Catherine were intrigued. It was their eyebrows that rose now. They are among the oldest creatures in creation, continued Ombrick. So little is known about them, and even less understood. It is said they oversee the health and well-being of planets. This puka is mysterious indeed, interrupted the Grand High Lama. He and the Lama stood serenely in their usual V formation. They'd entered the room, as always, in complete silence, and had startled our heroes with their arrival. "'You know him? It?' asked Ombrick, visibly surprised. "'We know he is a him, not an it,' replied a tallish llama. "'We know he has a vast knowledge,' said another. "'We know he is difficult to know,' said the shortest. "'We know he prefers to be unknown,' said one of the others." We've heard he likes eggs, said another. And chocolate, added the shortest one. We think, concluded the Grand High Lama. Catherine, North, and Ombrek mulled over that uncommonly informative aria of information from the llamas. A robe-wearing rabbit man who travels time and likes eggs, summarized North, trying not to laugh. And chocolate, said Catherine mischievously. A substance he apparently invented, interjected the Grand High Lama. I thought I invented chocolate, said Ombrick indignantly. That, my dear Ombrick, is what the puka wants you to think, replied a llama. 
Wethick, added another. Ombrick shook his head in confusion. I'm going time traveling. At least the past is certain. That much I do know. But do not tamper with the events in the past, warned the High Lama. It is forbidden, said the tallest Lama. And the Puka will not like it, said another. As the wizard entered the time machine and made his settings, he replied, Good! and vanished into the uncertainties of the past. North and Catherine stared at the clock for a few moments, then shared a concerned glance. I always worry about him when he goes back there, wherever there is, North admitted. Catherine gave a small nod. Me too. But he's a tough old bird, North reasoned, just as Kalish came waddling up and began nuzzling her head against them. This tough young bird needs feeding, he chuckled. He picked Catherine up and set her on Kalish's back. Your goose is as big as Petrov, and still growing. Want to help me feed her? asked Catherine. Maybe tonight. I've got to keep working, North told her, reaching up to brush her hair out of her face. Her hair was always falling over one eye, and North would often brush it back. Catherine looked down at her dashing friend. She was worried a little bit about him, too. He'd been working so hard, trying to figure out how to use the new magic sword. That's all right. Nightlight will help me, she assured him. She thought back to the day she, North, and Ombrick had bowed before the man in the moon, had pledged their oath to continue the fight against Pitch. North had sworn to use his sword wisely and well. So study he must. She was grateful for Nightlight's help, for being a guardian was harder than any of them had realized. And it was about to get harder than they'd ever imagined. Chapter 8. A Hop, Skip, and a Jump Through Time Deep inside the clock, Ulmrich was somersaulting through time at a furious pace. The world around him flickered from day to night faster than the blink of an eye. He saw seasons pass in seconds. Centuries flew by as he drifted up and away from the Lamadri. He looked skyward as the sun and stars spiraled past him at rocket speed. Day, night, day, night, faster than could be said, in and in reverse. The moon was there, too, and in a flash he saw the explosion of Pitch's galleon and the last great battle of the Golden Age. But it all happened too fast. The relics fell from the moon too quickly for him to track down. Umbrick wasn't worried. He would slow down his trajectory on the return trip and take note of their whereabouts. And if his plan worked, he wouldn't need to. He began to drift away from Earth, going deeper and deeper into the vast dazzlements of space. He was traveling so swiftly through time that comets, planets, and galaxies pivoted and sparkled around him like fireworks, but their size was beyond description. Then Ulmrich realized that the flashes he was seeing were the deaths of the Golden Age worlds. What he was watching was Pitch's galleon destroying one constellation after another. Then, as Ulmrich continued to pinwheel backward through time, the universe around him brightened. Golden Age ships coursed through the sky around him. This was it! The age he had studied for so long but never dreamed he would see. He could barely take it all in. The cities he saw were colossal, magnificent, more magical than anything he had ever imagined. It broke his heart to think of the vanished wonder and glory of this perfect era, and he began more determined than ever to implement his plan. He soon found himself at the infamous prison planet, the huge rusted dungeon where the fearlings had been locked after the Golden Age armies had captured them. As time slowed down, he stopped his journey just moments before Pitch was overtaken and the fearlings escaped. Ulmrich hid behind a large pillar an arm's length away from Pitch, who was standing in a guard station in front of the prison's only door. It was remarkable to see his nemesis as he had been before his changed evil. He looked every inch a great hero. Stalwart. Valiant even noble in his Golden Age military uniform. But his determined expression was weary and tinged with sorrow. 
From behind the massive door, Ombrick could hear a drone of whispers and mutterings from the prisoners. The noise would rise to a crescendo, then sink low, pulsing eerily from within. What an awful sound, thought Ombrick. It's like evil itself. To hear that every day after day would drive any man insane. And indeed, the ghostly noise seemed to weigh on pitch. His face was drawn, his fists clenched in anxiety. But then he pulled a silver locket from his tunic pocket. The chain hung around his neck. He tasked the clasp and it swung open, revealing a small photograph. Ombrick could just make out the face of a little girl. Pitch stared at the image, seeming to take great solace in the picture. His face softened and his sadness eased. Ombrick knew that expression. He'd seen it countless times. It was the look of a father gazing at his child. Pitch had a daughter. The wizard could feel Pitch's longing to see his child in person. The feeling sensed his longing, too. Their strange mutterings shifted in tone. Their pleadings took on the voice of a small girl. Please, Daddy, they whispered. Please, please, please open the door. A momentary spark of hope crossed Pitch's face. His eyes lit up, and then they dimmed as he recognized the sound for what it was. A fearling trick. He visibly steeled himself against the evil, bracing his shoulders, clenching his jaw. But the feeling started to beg again. Daddy, they cried. I'm trapped in here with these shadows and I'm scared. Please open the door. Help me, Daddy, please. Pitch looked again at the photograph. The pleading grew more desperate, more hypnotic. Pitch seemed to be slipping into a trance. Suddenly, his face grew wild with panic. He reached for the door. The locket fell from his neck. Umbert caught it in midair and was about to block Pitch from opening the prison door when the mysterious puka reappeared. Umbert found he could neither move nor utter a sound. The puka held up his hand and shook his head. That's a no-no, he scolded. The llamas had told Umbert that he could not change the events in his journeys through time. He could only observe them. The puka, it seemed, was there to stop his trying. Ombrick looked from the puka back to Pitch in time to witness agony and shock in the jailer's eyes. The desperation of a loving father trying to save his daughter from the fearlings. As a door swung open, all that was visible was a rolling mass of dark serpent-like creatures. Of course Pitch's daughter was not there. Before Pitch could even scream her name, he was surrounded by malevolent shadows. In less than an instant, they poured over, around, into him. It was a horrifying sight, one that Ulmrich would never forget. Pitch struggled valiantly, but he soon succumbed to the evil flooding him, twisting around him into a madman. He swelled to ten times his normal size. His face became monstrous and cruel. As Ombrick stared transfixed, he felt the familiar touch of the puka's egg-tipped staff on his shoulder. He was being sent back to the present again. But as he began to dim and vanish, he saw Pitch throw his head back and roar with a menacing laughter of ten thousand fearlings. Chapter 9 the Secret of the Sword While Ombrick was watching history unfold, North was in the Lamjury Library, studying the new sword. He'd been examining it for weeks, with all the methods at his disposal. Magnifying glasses of every shape, size, and purpose. Microscopes, maxiscopes, telescopes. He'd come to so many mystifying discoveries, it boggled his agile mind. The metal of the sword could change itself. Sometimes it was mostly iron, then it shifted to steel, then to metals that North couldn't even classify. It could become highly magnetic or immeasurably strong, and at times it could emit various kinds of light. Sunlight, moonlight, comet light, lights that had no name. North began to realize that the weapon was indeed a living thing. 
In battle, it would transform itself into a conventional sword, a long blade with a protective cover over the handle. But depending on the circumstances, it would sprout various mechanical additions. In darkness, for instance, a curious light-emitting orb would appear. When danger was imminent, the jewels on the handguard would glow red. And at other times, the handguard itself would change, sometimes revealing the maps of the stars or of the moon or the earth itself. But the how, why, and what of these gadgets were still a mystery to him. North thought about what Ombrek always said about magic, that its real power was in belief. North knew for certain that this sword had powers beyond explanation. The sword, he hoped, could tell him what he most needed to know. So he closed his eyes and concentrated on that belief with all his mind and heart. I believe, I believe, I believe, he said very quietly. As he chanted the phrase over and over, his thoughts began to grow uncluttered, pure, sharp, until he had only one question. Where were the other relics? It was as if the sword now guided his mind. And then, with the subtlest of clicks, North felt the sword change. He opened his eyes to see that a metal orb had appeared. It opened, unwrapping like an intricate puzzle. Inside was a map of the earth, and on the map were four glittering jewels. Four jewels. North's mind raced. Four jewels. Were they the four relics? That had to be it. Each jewel marked their position. They simply had to follow this map. Eager to share the news with the wizard, North raced through the lamagery, finding Ombrick in the tower just as he was reappearing from his latest time travel. I have the answer, old man, North cried, slapping him on the back. And I have new questions, said Ombrick wearily. At that moment, Catherine ran into the room. Nightlight is missing, she shouted. Chapter 10 Revelations, Terror, and Daring Deeds Catherine tried to rein in her panic, but her quivering voice betrayed her. He hasn't returned since last night. No one has seen him, she explained in a rush. Both Ombrick and North tensed. They knew that Nightlight's visits were as regular as clockwork. They also knew that Santa Clausen was always his last stop before he returned to the lamagery. Only one thing could delay the lad, said North, his voice low. Pitch, whispered Catherine. Even as they spoke, Ombrick was already trying to contact his owls. They were constantly on watch in his library and forever at the ready to report to him telepathically. He concentrated with all his might, but the line of mental communication was severed. How could that be? He could not even sense an echo of emotion from the owls. If they could not speak to him, he should at least be able to feel them, especially if they were in danger or afraid. But there was nothing. It was this nothingness that frightened him most. He spun around and caught North's eye. He didn't need to say a word. North understood immediately. To Santoff Clausen, North asked, and right speedily came Ombrick's answer. The question was, which method would get them there right speedily? Ombrick knew he didn't have the stamina for astral projection. Time travel always left him exhausted. Besides, North and Catherine couldn't join him in that mode. The reindeer? They needed the spectral boy to create the highways of light upon which they flew. The djinn, of course, was gone. Umbrick's mind was anxiously calculating all the possibilities when he was interrupted by the sudden appearance of the llamas. We have adequate convoyance, said the Grand High Llama. It is swift, said another llama, and comfortable, added a third, and easy to pilot agreed a shortish one. Ombrick dreaded the series of answers his next question would cause. The llamas answered questions only in fragments. Where is the craft? Ombrick tried to sound patient and urgent at the same time. The llamas looked at one another, deciding who would answer first. Ombrick, North, and Catherine shifted impatiently. Time was wasting. Finally, the Grand High Llama spoke. The craft... Why, you stand within it, he said with stunning simplicity. 
You need merely to say where you'd like to go, and this tower will rocket you there with both speed and accuracy. Then the llamas began to shuffle silently toward the courtyard. We are certain you can handle the situation, said the Grand High Lama as they reached the arching doorway. But we suggest you sit down for the trip, said the tallest. The trajectory is most speedy, said the shortest. At least when we last used it, said another. Thirty thousand years ago, added the Grand High Lama as he exited last. North, Ombrick, and Catherine looked quizzically at one another. They each took a chair and then glanced up at the glass-topped ceiling of the tower. It was perfect for observing a journey. We have all we need, I think, said North, gripping his sword. Catherine suppressed a smile. She knew Kalish, asleep under a nearby table, was aboard for the trip, but she thought it best to keep that to herself. Ombrick turned to her. My dear, give the order. She grasped the arms of her chair tightly. To Santoff Clausen, as fast as... But before she could finish the sentence, they were already blasting off. Chapter 11. As the Tower Flies The llamas were true to their word. The tower was a marvelous airship. No sooner had they taken off than the entire interior began to mechanically transform. As the tower shifted horizontally in its trajectory, the chairs glided towards the glass ceiling. The floor began to pivot and lean, as did the walls, until they formed a sort of ship's cabin with large moon-shaped windows. The woodwork, the mosaic floor tiles, the wallpaper, the instrument panels, every aspect of the cabin took on different shapes of the moon, full or half or crescent. It was enchanting and, as promised, comfortable. North examined all the charts and instruments carefully. This screen shows our present position, he determined, and then pointed to another and another. This one our speed, this one our route. This one our time of arrival. He seemed pleased by the instrument's reading. We should be there within the hour, he told them. Catherine was relieved to hear North's prediction. To travel from the Himalayas to the farthest corner of eastern Siberia in a matter of minutes was an astounding thing. Even the reindeer had not been able to achieve that kind of speed. But Ombrick was quiet. Catherine could tell from his expression that even this was not fast enough. Then she saw the locket he clutched in his hand. What's that? she asked. Ombrick was lost in thought and didn't seem to hear her. She gently took the locket from him and opened it to see the picture of the young girl, who was close to her own age. Catherine looked intently at this lovely girl with raven black hair and haunting eyes. She's Pitch's daughter, said Ombrick, his own eyes closing as he tried in vain to reach the owls. I saw him holding it, back in time, before he became evil. Catherine was amazed. She'd no memory of her own father. And though she tried to imagine what he looked like, the image in her mind was never very clear. She'd been too young when she had lost him. It was equally difficult to imagine Pitch ever being a father or that he'd ever been good. She remembered with a shudder that Pitch had vowed to turn her into a fearling princess, but mixed with that fear of dread was now a sadness that twined within her own sense of loss and longing. Pitch had a daughter. What had happened to her? And what had happened to Nightlight? Kalish had found her way to the back of the tower. She honked and struggled to squeeze through the main door of to the main cabin, and with one great shove, she made it. She snuggled next to Catherine, her long neck twisting around her protectively, her feathered body a warm brace to lean against. North looked at Catherine's sorrow-filled face. He was glad that Kalish was there to comfort her. He knew from Ombrick's concentrated silence that things in Santa Clausen would be perilous. So he steadied himself for the dark that lay ahead. Chapter 12. Delicate Darkness Before the travelers knew it, their craft started dropping in elevation, flying lower and lower until it was practically skimming the treetops of Santa Clausen's enchanted forest. They had to squint to see the village. Clouds blocked the moon and the stars, more unsettling that there was not a single light shining from any window. 
The village was a shadow. The airship landed with surprising silence at the edge of the forest. North carefully opened the moon-shaped door, and they all gazed out onto their village. It had never been this quiet. North looked to Ombrick with a tense, questioning expression, then unsheathed the magic sword and climbed up first. Stay behind me. Run if I say so, he told Catherine. The sword was transforming itself as he spoke, its light emerging magically from the blade. The glow lit their way. North sensed a vibration. Was the sword signaling danger? He was not sure. They walked towards Big Root slowly, scanning the mournful landscape for any signs of life. Catherine had never seen a night so black or heard a silence so quiet. Not even on the night when Pitch had first found her and her friends in the forest. It was as if all life in the place had gone away. There was no movement, no breeze. Not one firefly or nightbird flew to greet them. Even the raccoons and badgers were nowhere to be seen. Catherine reached for North's hand and kept the other on Kalish's neck. Where is everyone? she whispered. Instead of answering her, Ombrick stopped short. Something was glinting in the light from North's sword. Armbrick stooped to pick up what appeared to be a small piece of glass. He held it up to the light. It was a tiny porcelain squirrel. It was like a toy. Turning it this way and that, he said, It appears that Pitch has further mastered the spells of enslavement. He looked troubled and began to walk forward again, his eyes continuing to search the ground. Though the eerie quiet persisted, the thick cloud cover began to dissipate as the threesome made their way into the village, so at least some moonlight began to penetrate the gloom, but this simply allowed them to better see the horror all around them. In every direction, Catherine saw small porcelain versions of living things, whole platoons of squirrels, raccoons, and foxes that all looked to be frozen in mid-battle. Try as she might, Catherine couldn't keep her tears back. Had Pitch frozen everything? She nearly stumbled over the spirit of the forest. The spirit's normally flowing veils hung still and stiff. Her gemstones were dulled with the lifeless shine of ceramics. Her frozen expression was one of fierce determination. In her hands, she clasped a jeweled sword. She had clearly been petrified at a moment of intense struggle just as she had once done to all those who had fallen under her spell. Catherine peered into the spirit's glassy eyes and noticed something she had never expected to see there. Fear. Then Catherine wiped her tears and willed herself to shed no more. She needed to keep alert. She jogged to catch up with North and Umbrick. North was barreling ahead. Catherine desperately hoped to find at least one living thing had escaped Pitch's enslavement spell. But when they neared the village in Big Root, she realized that was not to be. Every breathing creature in Santa Clausen had been turned into a china doll, even the bear. Again, Catherine had to fight back tears. The bear looked so small and helpless now. North's horse Petrov was lying on his side in front of Big Root's shattered door. He looked as if he had been on his hind legs in the midst of kicking the shadows away when he'd been overwhelmed by Pitch's spell. North ran to him, speechless. Ombrick walked towards the parents of the children. They lay surrounding the tree, frozen, terrified expressions marring their faces. His fears turned to outrage as he swept into Big Roots itself. The owls sat immobile on their perches around Ombrick's globe. The dozens of honeybees and ants that resided in Big Root laid scattered on the floor, like tiny china game pieces, tossed aside by an unruly child. Ombrick and North surveyed the damage in stunned silence. The library was stripped bare. Not a single book remained. The beakers and test tubes Ombrick used for his magical experiments had been dashed to the ground. No books and no children, Ombrick said quietly. And where was Mr. Query? Catherine came up behind them. Where was Petter? Sasha? All the Williams? She sank to her knees, 
carefully brushing her insect friends to one side so they wouldn't be stepped on. Then, one glittering piece of crystal caught her eye. She reached for it. Only then did she discover a sliver of a blade nearby. Then another, and another. Her hand shook as she examined the pieces, glistening drops like beads of light surrounding them. It's the tip of Nightlight's staff, she gasped. Umber crouched beside Catherine. A small, tarnished moonbeam, Nightlight's moonbeam, was hidden beneath the largest piece of the shattered blade. With great care, Catherine cupped the beam in her hands. What happened, moonbeam? she asked gently. Where is everyone? Only Ombrick spoke moonbeam, so he waved his staff, and suddenly the little fellow's memories were displayed on the round glass of the globe bed. The moonbeam shimmered with all the strength it could muster, though it wavered and flickered. Ombrick, North, and Catherine could see and hear the terrible story of Pitch's return. Chapter 13 The Moonbeam Tells His Tale of Woe We are in the big root tree, began the moonbeam, on the limbs outside a window. We watch the children in their beds. The Catherine book is telling stories of Kalish. All warm and happy the children are. And so are we my nightlight boy and I. But we feel something that is a bother to us. A pitch kind of scariness. It comes like a wind. We cannot see it, but we are feeling it. The clouds come dark and quick, and the moonlight and the stars are gone all suddenly. So my nightlight boy looks out onto the forest. All around is a badly sound. The forest creatures from every side are a chatter and screamly, so fiercely fast the shadows come, out of the forest, toward the village, toward the big root, toward us. The forest spirit lady, she is fighting most ferocious, but the pitch cannot be stopped. He wears the metal gin suit and has a sword so dark, it takes all light that comes near. The pitch says words, spells, I think, and all who are close go changed. They are made small and still, and they move no more. My nightlight boy, his face is wild. He is a look of a knowing plan. This look I seen whenever he is about to do a deed most smart and daring. So I listens as he tells me with his thinking talk. The game I try will be most tricky. Don't be fooled by what you see. Then he looks close at me and says fiercely strong, Fly straight and true, and never fear. Then he takes the staff on which I am tied and points me at the pitch. He throws me with all his mites. So fast I go, fast as light, and into the metal I hits. The diamond dagger in which I live goes quick through the metal of the gin armor and into the darkness of pitch himself. I hear the pitch make a moan of deepest hurt, and I feel him fall. But I can see the cold black heart of him. I have not pierced it. All around me is darkness. The cold heart still beats. The pitch, he's moving, I can tell. But what is happening outside I cannot see. I hear many shouts and screams most loud. I hear the bear a roaring and the horse makes his battle sounds. But one by one they all go quiet like. I hear the pitch. He breathes hard and heavy, but he is a shouting now. Where is it? Tell me! He's asking most meanly. And then he makes a groan sound, and I feel the pulling. Then I am out of the pitch, but he is pointing me, pointing me at my nightlight boy. We are in the Ombrick library, but there be no books. All gone. The little wormy is gone. Just my nightlight boy and the children's. He is affront the children's as if to protect them, but he is much hurt. On his knees from the hurt, but his face is not fearish. Neither are the children's, and that makes the pitch anger get bad. Very bad. So he's a shouting, I want the books! The books of spells! Not any of the Williams or the Petter boy or the Sasha girl tells a word. Feelings, they are all around the room now. 
coming closer, closer to my nightlight boy and the children's. But my nightlight boy says loud and clear, we fear you none. I've never heard him speak with his voice. It is a magical voice he has, like faraway memories and echoes of long ago. Then he laughs at the pitch and leaps to attack. But the pitch throws me and the staff at my nightlight boy, and then all around is strangeness. The diamond t tip hits my boy, and there's lights and shatterings. The diamond, it did not pierce my boy, but it is broken into many pieces, and my boy lays still. On the ground, he shines not bright, but dim and flickering. My broken dagger has let me loose. I am free. So I goes to my boy, but the pitch hits me with his dark sword, and it hurts me. Take some of my light, so I am weak feeling and cannot help my boy. The children look a little feared, but they muster strong and stare angrily at the pitch and his fearlings. I need those books, says pitch, all quiet and scary. Ombrick must give them to me, so you little ones will be my bait. Then he opens his dark cape. It seems to eat the light as it wraps around the room. In a blink, all is gone. The fearling's gone. The children's gone. My nightlight boy gone too. And the pitch. Just me left. And the toy turned owls. Then the moonbeam turns to Ombrick and the others. The children's need us. My nightlight boy said his game was most tricky and to never fear. I am trying. I hate the feeling I am having. A scaredy feeling. But I am stronger by telling of the tale. Chapter 14 A Moonbeam, a Mystery, and a Muddle The moonbeam was exhausted and dimmed again as he lay in Catherine's palm. Ombrick, North, and Catherine were each trying to make sense of everything the moonbeam had told them. They knew the situation was dire, but they kept surprisingly calm. They had been growing increasingly confident since taking the man in the moon's oath. And now, the three of them began to work almost as one, as one mind. Ombrick had read that friendship could produce a sort of magic. North was new to the concept, but he was keenly aware of its possibilities. And Catherine, the youngest, was, in this case, the wisest. She knew in her bones that friendship was a magic with powers beyond words or possibilities. And so, the magic grew stronger. They could feel one another's thoughts coming together, sorting through the various threads of what the moonbeam had reported, discovering questions, searching together for answers. This curious union caught them completely off guard, especially Ombrick. Never in his centuries of conjuring had he felt this sort of shared purpose. A mental mind-melding of sorts, he mused. It was strange, thrilling. Catherine wondered the first question aloud. Where has Pitch taken Nightlight and the children? What is this new sword he wields that can devour light? North asked next. And why the devil did Pitch want the library? The diamond dagger was shattered, Ombrick declared. All is strangeness. The wizard's mind became totally focused as he tried to fathom the muddles and mysteries the moonbeam had presented to them. His mustache and beard began to twirl on their own at a lively pace. He felt Catherine and North connecting to his thoughts. Ombrick suddenly strode over to his empty bookshelves and began in examining each intently. Only a few scraps of paper remained, a bit from spells of the ancient Egyptians, another from interesting unexplainables of Atlantis, some tattered corners of random maps and charts. Even Catherine's storybook was missing. There was no denying it. The library Ombrick had carefully amassed over hundreds of years had utterly disappeared. Ombrick closed his eyes and concentrated, casting about for remains of leftover magic. I find no evidence of a vanishing spell, he said, his voice edged with small relief. No magic was used. 
The books still exist, somewhere. Then his eyes grew wide. The tips of his shoes stood on end. Catherine and Ombrick stared at him warily. He's taken them to the Earth's core, Ombrick proclaimed triumphantly. That's where Ombrick obtained the lead. His saber and cloak are made with it. North cocked his head. Lead? What's so special about this lead? Lead found at the core of the Earth has been there since the planet was first formed, Ombrick explained. It has never known light, of any kind, so no light can penetrate it. It absorbs it. That's how Pitch was able to attack Nightlight and the Moonbeam. He stole some of their light. The madman is growing more wildly by the day, North exclaimed. And the library? Why is he after that? Ombrick spoke more carefully, as if figuring it out as he went. Pitch needs all the spells and enchantments in my volumes to become more powerful. To become, perhaps, invincible, he added with some measure of awe. But somehow, the library disappeared before he could get it. Ombrick frowned. And that's the part I can't make heads or tails of. Without magic, how could all these books just disappear? North asked. Exactly, Ombrick said. That's the puzzlement. Catherine took in all of this new information. Her mind worked with lightning speed as she pierced together all the clues herself. What the moonbeam had told them, what they had found here, and what she thought it might all mean. Then suddenly, she knew. It's nightlight, she shouted. He told the moonbeam not to believe everything it sees. He found a way. North and Umber considered the idea both becoming lost in thought. Then North's mustache began to twirl in its own, as Ombrick's had moments before. If Pitch is at the planet's core, it's a trap, North said, restraining his rage. He knows we'll come to rescue the children, he drew his sword. But he has never faced this blade since the Golden Age, and never with me at its command. He turned to Ombrick. How did we get to the Earth's core, old man? Umbrick felt so proud of them. They were becoming a very potent and powerful team. But this elation gave way quickly to disappointment. He had no answer to the question. That is a journey no man has ever made, he said with a furrowed brow. The Norse sword began to glow and clatter. The cover of the blade's grip began to twist and unfold as it had before. One of its stones started to shine brightly. All three of them peered at it. North's heart surged. This is what I'd started to tell you earlier, old man, he cried. In a flurry of words, he laid out what he'd discovered thus far of the sword's powers. The sword is telling us where we must go, where the next relic lies. Umbrick nodded sagely. His brows unfurled. He almost smiled. He almost began to laugh. What is it, old man? asked North impatiently. "'Why, it's a map of Earth,' replied the wizard. "'We must go to Easter Island.' "'Easter Island?' asked North. "'Yes. The legend says that's where the puka lives.' The trio began to think very hard. Mustaches, beards, and eyebrows were twirling wildly on the men as they concentrated. As for Catherine, though she did not notice it, a single curl right in the middle of her forehead was twirling too. Chapter 15 Wherein Friends Must Separate Catherine spotted Petrov and the bear lying just outside Big Root's door and winced. They didn't look as though they were in pain, but still, it must be terrible to be unable to move or talk or even blink. Can we unfreeze them now? she asked Ombrick. Maybe they can tell us where the books are. I say we fly to the center of the earth and rescue the children, North blustered. Every muscle in his body strained to do something, anything, to help the children. How do you plan to do that? Umbrick asked, folding his arms across his chest. I'll figure it out on the way, North said. Let's take things one thing at a time, shall we? Umbrick told him, looking around. Perhaps Catherine is right, and the animals can tell us what became of my books. But an enslavement spell this powerful can't be reversed quickly. 
It needs to be done carefully and well. He shook his head. It's the work of many, many hours. Then they'll have to stay like this until we return, North said to Ombrick. You can release them after we've crushed the Nightmare King. We'll help you. Ombrick tugged at his beard, frowning. Some of these spells are trickier than others. If I wait too long, I fear the spell could be irreversible. He looked at the porcelain creatures scattered across his floor. There are no two ways about it. I'll have to stay behind in Santoff Clausen, and you'll have to continue on to Easter Island. Easter Island? We have to get to pitch, North bellowed. Catherine added, Nightlight is hurt. The puka, if he can be found, will be able to lead you to the Earth's core, Umbrick explained. Puka lore indicates that he has a series of tunnels that span the interior of the globe. North began to object, but Ombrick insisted. By the time you reach Pitch, I expect to have restored our friends here and discovered the whereabouts of my library. Looking up at him with her steady gaze, Catherine said, You can do whatever you set your mind to. Ombrick raised an eyebrow. The student reinterprets the teacher's lesson, he said. Well done. Just do me a favor, old man, North conceded. Release Petra first. I can't stand a scene like this. Ombrick agreed. Then, with no time to lose, Catherine, Kalish, and North left Big Root. On their way to the forest, Catherine looked into old William's frozen eyes. We'll be back, she promised him. And so will all of your Williams. She climbed onto the air shuttle, strapped Kalish into a seat, and then did the same for herself. To Easter Island. Let's hope this bunnyman creature actually exists, North said, scanning the skies for signs of trouble. There's no setting for the Earth's core. As he watched them rocket away, Ombrick knew he could trust the brave girl he had raised and the young man who had been his apprentice. They would do what needed to be done. Chapter 16. The Curl Twirls. Catherine's curl began to twirl again as she and North streaked towards Easter Island. She did not like that they could not stay together, but she was certain that Ombrick was correct. Only he could manage the delicate and lengthy task of enduing all the enslavement smells that Pitch had conjured against Santoff Clausen. The parents, the owls, the insects, the spirit of the forest, the bear, Petrov, Everything that breathed would have to be individually untoyed, as Catherine had termed it. Still, she had been brave for so long, and truth be told, she was a little weary of having to be such a grown-up. She wanted Ombrick near. He was like a father to her. And in times of danger, it feels good to have one's father near. Not thousands of miles away. But she bore this anxious feeling silently. She knew they would need to be at their very best, perhaps even more than their best, to save their friends and once again undo the dark plans of pitch. They were far above the ocean of the Pacific now. The moon was clear and bright, and so close that they thought they could see the man in the moon in his moon box smiling down at them. They rocketed forward, faster even than they had flown on the way to Santa Clausen and the stone on the magic sword that marked Easter Island blinked steadily. Catherine looked at it with alarm. Is that a bad sign? North shook his head. Quite the opposite. It means we're getting closer. Kalish honked. She's glad, Catherine said. Of course she is. We're on the wildest goose chase in history, North joked. Catherine was glad for the joke and even more glad that, to know that North sensed her worries and was trying to cheer her. The dials of the airship let out an alarm. Up ahead was Easter Island. The sun was just beginning to rise when the ship had settled gently on a sandy beach. It cast a soft glow over the island, and Catherine could hardly wait to get out. North opened the shuttle's doors and climbed down the ladder. Catherine patted her pocket to make sure she had her dagger. 
Satisfied, she turned to Kalish. Stay here until I know it's safe, she told the gosling. Then she jumped onto the sand after North. Together, they began to explore the island. Hundreds of giant stone heads sat ominously across the barren beach. Catherine had seen drawings of the colossal sculptures in Umbrick's library, but they were much stranger than she'd expected, and larger than she'd imagined. North ran his hand across a mouth, a narrow slit beneath an enormous stone nose. These were carved, he said, but by who? There were no signs of life, no humans running over to see what had landed on their beach, no birds calling in alarm. Catherine and North walked among the stone heads and wondered if there were any living creatures on the island at all. The only sound was that of the waves coming in and going out. Oddly, Catherine thought she smelled a hint of hot cocoa in the salty sea air. And then she had the strangest sensation that they were being watched. And they were. One of the stone heads had turned in their direction. Then another, and another. With a screech of stone scraping against stone, all the heads, as far as they could see, were slowly rotating towards them. The orb on the magic sword was glowing even brighter. North took a chance. Where can we find the puka? he shouted out. We need to get to the Earth's core. On the double. The heads didn't answer. But as the echo of his shouts died away, something began to emerge from the top of each of the stone sculptures. Two stone shafts, almost like ears, slowly rose, stretching to sharp points at the tips. The heads had grown stone rabbit ears, every one of them. Catherine and North exchanged uneasy glances. Then something, or someone, twisted up out of the ground a dozen feet away, sending sand and grass flying in all directions. Catherine and North found themselves looking at an extremely tall rabbit. He stood completely upright, not crouched like a bunny. He was at least seven feet tall, with ears, and wore green egg-shaped glasses and a thick green robe with egg-shaped golden buttons. Around his waist was a purple sash and waistcoat with egg-shaped pockets. He held a tall staff with an egg at its tip. Catherine gave the rabbit man an uneasy smile. The rabbit did not respond. He didn't even blink. In fact, he was so still that Catherine thought he might be a statue too. She took a step closer, but to her utter surprise... A group of armor-covered eggs with tiny arms and legs emerged from under the hem of the rabbit's robe. The eggs raised their bows. Their arrows, she noticed, had tiny egg-shaped points. Catherine pulled back again, but North was less cautious. He'd seen the rabbit's nose twitch and had an inkling. "'You are the puka, I presume?' he asked. The rabbit became a sudden blur of motion. In less than a blink, he was standing directly in front of them. I am E. Aster Bunnymund, he said in a deep, melodious voice. I've been expecting you. Chapter 17 In which Pitch appreciates North's ingenuity, but proves to be a dark customer indeed. North's mechanical gin was a truly inspired invention. Pitch took delight in not only the theft of his enemy's creation, but also in the wonderful things it could do. While he was inside the gin, Pitch could not only venture out into the sunlight, he could turn into any number of machines, most notably one that could fly. The perfect way to transport the children across a vast distance. With the children and nightlight trapped within his lead cloak, Pitch had transformed the gin into just such a machine. He cared nothing for beauty, but he appreciated the elaborate design of the flying sled machine. 
that swelled out of the gin's shoulders, back, and arms. Every floorboard, deck, and bolt was a mechanical marvel. A surge of envy rolled through him, for it was clearly a combination of ancient magic and human invention that had created this masterpiece. The Nightmare King had never imagined anything that even approached North's genius, but he would. Oh, once he had all the books in the wizard's library, he would. He narrowed his eyes and issued a curt command to the djinn. Take me to the core. Propellers began to spin, and within seconds, the sleigh was piloting across the sky, crossing continents, then oceans, finally landing upon one of the most desolate places on Earth a volcano at the very top of the Andes Mountains. Inside the cloak, the children of Santa Clausen whispered to one another about where they might be and whether or not Ombrick and North had already started their rescue mission. William, the absolute youngest, fumed in the darkness. I wish I had a sword, he muttered. I do too, said his oldest brother. If I had North's new sword, why I'd... Silence! roared Pitch. The volcano was a shortcut to his new lair. As they entered the open fissure of the volcano, the flying machine's propellers folded tight. They were speeding down faster and faster, straight for the center of the earth. The children, trapped in an inky darkness of Pitch's cloak, could see almost nothing, though their ears began to pop. Their only light was Nightlight's considerably diminished glow. Tall William and Petter, aided by fog, tried to push their way out of the cloak prison, to no avail. The black cloth wasn't woven, but made of a metal mesh that was flexible but impenetrable, no matter how hard the boys pushed and clawed at it. Sasha did her best to comfort William, the absolute youngest, and some of the other children, but she was the most concerned about nightlight. He lay slumped against the cloak, his eyes closed. His light grew more and more faint. It started to flicker. William, the absolute youngest, cried out, Is he dying? Tears slipped down the children's cheeks. They held their breaths, watching and hoping that the youngest William was wrong. Sasha grasped nightlight's hand. It felt strange in hers like it was made of light and air and crystals. But in a moment, he began to glow, faintly again, and she breathed a sigh of relief. To her surprise, Nightly reached out, collected her tears in his hand, and then did the same with those of the other children. He closed his fists tight around them before pulling his fist to his chest. The children could see where the bookworm was hiding under Nightlight's jacket. I hope Mr. Query is all right, said Sasha. Remember, whispered Petter, we mustn't tell Pitch about Mr. Query. Just as they all nodded in agreement, they slammed down on a hard rock surface. The children tumbled onto a hard floor, scraping their knees and elbows. Then Pitch flung open his cloak, sending them spinning and rolling in all directions. Sasha banged into a wall. Petter rolled away from Pitch's raised foot only seconds before he brought it down, hard. Tall William did his best to gather the youngest children in a tight group. They were in, the, in a giant room with walls of grayish, melted looking metal. The air reeked of sulfur. Shallow pools of milky lava flowed around one end of the room. The children could feel feelings weaving in and out of their legs like shadowy black cats. Fog flinched and batted furiously at one that seemed to be whispering in his ear. Sasha pressed her lips together and swallowed a scream as another slithered around her face and head. Nightlight had helped them see inside the cloak. But here the walls seemed to absorb his dim glow, leaving them in a darkness so thick they began to wonder if Pitch had swallowed up all the light in the world. Then there was a sound like fingers snapping, 
and blue flames appeared from the lava pools, casting everything in an eerie glow. The feelings pulled back from the light, but couldn't resist continuing to reach for the children, their long, tentacle-like fingers creeping within inches of their faces. The older boys drew the younger children behind them, and they all instinctively formed a protective circle around Nightlight. Pitch smirked at their efforts. He commanded the gin suit to transform itself back into a metal man. Then an inky vapor rose out of the gin's ear, oozing outward and sharpening into the shape of Pitch, most preferable for himself. He kicked the mechanical suit aside and loomed over his hostages. Sasha felt the hands of the smaller children reaching for hers, pulling at her sleeves. She forced herself to stay calm. Ombrick, North, and Catherine would move heaven and earth to come to their rescue. She knew that as surely as she knew that the sky was blue, the grass was green, and fireflies cheated at games of tag. Still, she couldn't keep herself from averting her eyes as Pitch's gaze lingered on each of them. When he reached Tall William, however, the boy stared back. You said you had no plans to hurt us, Tall William said as Pitch loomed over him. I remember what I said, boy, Pitch answered. If your precious wizard hands over his library, perhaps I'll keep my promise. Or perhaps not. Then he pointed his long, skeleton arms towards nightlight. But you, he added with a malevolent smile aimed directly at the spectral boy, are another story. Nightlight stared back at Pitch with a weak but mischievous grin. The children's strength was feeding his own, and his light was steadily brightening. He thought of Catherine and how much he wanted to see her again, and became stronger still. He had spent thousands of years trapped inside this monster. He could survive whatever he wanted to do to him now. Enraged by Nightlight's smirk, Pitch raised his hand as if to crush him. Sasha shrieked, but Nightlight's grin only grew wider. I'll turn you into my feeling prince, Pitch threatened, and your friend Catherine, when she arrives, will be my princess. Nightlight knew exactly what Pitch was doing, trying to frighten him by threatening Catherine. He deliberately smiled wider. Pitch reached out his long, gnarly hand, and with agonizing slowness, let his fingers hover just an inch from Nightlight's head. Now you will be mine. You kept me in prison for centuries. Day after day, year after year, I dreamed of revenge. He lowered his hand, but the instant he gripped Nightlight, there was a brilliant explosion of light sending Pitch staggering backward. He grasped his hand in pain, and for a moment, his palm and fingers seemed to glow, then became flesh-colored. The look on Pitch's face was an unsettling mix of fury and something else, something the children had never expected to see, something that looked like sorrow. Pitch screamed, he covered his injured hand with his cloak and pulled out his sword with his other, then pointed toward a small cramped cell that hung suspended from the ceiling. A swarm of feelings picked up Nightlight and threw him inside the lead cage. Please be my guest, Pitch said, his voice suddenly taking on a cheerful tone. In this solid lead prison, created especially for you. Pitch slammed the door with the tip of his sword. The sword's point then transformed and sharpened into the shape of a key. He locked the door, and the key transformed back into his sword. The only way to open that door will be to kill me, he said with a gleeful smile. And who amongst you is up to that? Then he laughed in a way that left the children feeling helpless. Chapter 18 a surprise twist with a chocolate center. The rabbit and North eyed each other, sizing one another up. 
North had been dubious about this fabled rabbit man since Ombrick had first described him. North liked to think that he and Ombrick were the world's greatest hero and wizard. The idea that this rabbit was their equal, perhaps their superior, did not sit well with the prideful Nicholas St. North. But he would give the puka a chance. You've been expecting us, North said wryly. Yes and no. I have, and I haven't. Maybe. Maybe not. I did, however, have an inkling, the rabbit answered. He opened one of his egg-shaped pockets and withdrew some egg-shaped candies. Their outer shells were pebbled with an astonishing variety of delicately iced decorations. Please, have a chocolate. I make the best in the universe, the rabbit said. That was the sweetest scent Catherine had noticed earlier. Chocolate. But this was so alluring that she could barely think of anything else. This wasn't just a whiff of some common candy. It was a hypnotizing mist of taste possibility. This one has a caramel center made with the milk of an intergalactic bovine creature that on occasion jumps over the moon the puka told her, waving it under her nose. And this one, marshmallow made from the whipped eggs of Asian peacocks. Bunnyman's eyes glistened. His nose twitched and he leaned forward, holding out a pair of chocolates. Catherine wavered. She was so hungry. In all their dashing about, she and North hadn't remembered to pack anything to eat. So she reached for one of the chocolates. Before North could object, the puka turned to him. You, sir, would likely enjoy something darker, wilder. He pulled forth a candy of impressive size. This egg is made with the cacao leaves that grow in the dark center of the great caves of Kalukata. It contains a pinch of mint from the ice caps of Mars. It also has three molecules of Hawaiian lava sprouts. For a little extra kick. Never had North smelled something so tantalizing. It was almost as tempting as the jewels the spirit of the forest had used to lure his band of outlaws in the enchanted forest. She had turned his men into stone elves, so he couldn't help but be a little suspicious of this offering. Besides, the puka's egg warriors were still pointing their bows at them. You have a piece first, North countered. I should, the rabbit agreed. Then he sighed. But I shouldn't. Couldn't. Shan't. Won't. It's a long story, full of woe. That made not a lick of sense to North. But he couldn't resist the chocolate egg. He was even hungrier than Catherine was. All right, but call off your warriors, he demanded. Yes, of course. Bunnyman waved a paw, and the eggs lowered their weapons and stepped away in perfect unison. Impressive, North noted, and deeply peculiar. He decided that the puka was probably harmless enough, but still, one could never be entirely sure. The air was rich with an overwhelming scent of chocolate, and Catherine could resist its spell no longer. She had been waiting politely for North to take a chocolate before eating her own. But now she popped the caramel egg into her mouth. A look of bliss crossed her face. Her eyes closed. Both North and Bunnyman watched her carefully, North out of concern, and Bunnyman with an eagerness to hear her reaction. Catherine began to sway slowly back and forth as if in a dream. She was bewitched by the chocolatey goodness. The puka could wait no longer. You liked it? he asked, a single twitching whisker betraying his intense interest. Catherine smiled, her mouth still flooded with the flavor even after she'd swallowed the candy. The best chocolate I ever had or thought I would ever have, she answered dreamily. Perfect, said the rabbit, the rest of his whiskers now twitching along his nose. Then he slammed his staff into the ground, and the earth opened up beneath them. 
Catherine and Norse stumbled forward, spinning down a hole that seemed to be digging itself as they fell. Clumps of dirt and rock whirled past them. When they stopped, the hole above them closed, and they saw that their chamber led to another egg-shaped chamber, and another, and another. There was an endless row of them, stretching as far as they could see. Hundreds of living eggs of various sizes, designs, and uniforms strode about on their toothpick-thin legs, engaged in a wide array of duties. Mixing chocolate, making candy eggs, decorating eggs, painting eggs, polishing eggs, packaging eggs. It was all very, very egg-centric. Catherine gazed about in wonder, then spied something familiar in a chamber up ahead. It was their ship! Bunnyman had somehow brought it to the underground as well. She sighed with relief. Now she wouldn't have to worry about Kalish being left behind. Still, she wanted Kalish to stay put and she was completely sure this strange underground world was safe. Come, Bunnyman invited them, gesturing grandly. I have much to show you. They passed a vast display of every conceivable type of egg. I have eggs from every species that ever laid them, Bunnyman said expansively. Dodo birds, pterodactyls, dinosaurs, the eggmen of Quacklandia. On one wall, North and Catherine saw a picture of a familiar green and blue planet, only it was egg-shaped, not round. Is that supposed to be Earth? Catherine asked. Bunnyman traced the image reverently. Yes. Many zillions of years ago, he answered. At the time, it was egg-shaped. Unfortunately, ovals have an unstable orbit. If left unchecked, the planet would have swirled closer and closer to the sun and eventually been cooked like a hard-boiled egg. Catherine stared again at the picture. But how did it become round? Oh, I fixed it. A nip here, a tuck there, the puka said matter-of-factly. It's rather sad, really. Ovals are such an interesting shape, and circles, well, so ordinary, common, dull. Then he sighed deeply as if saving the planet had been a particularly distressing household chore. I used the excess dirt to make a few more continents. Australia was my best work, I think, he said. I'm quite good at digging. Catherine blinked. You made Australia? Right after I finished the Himalayas, he replied. His whiskers gave a twitch. But enough geography. I have many, many more eggs to show you. He spun on a back paw and leaned in towards Catherine. The egg is the most perfect shape in the universe. Don't you agree? We do, Catherine said, nodding enthusiastically, sensing that this would please the rabbit and that pleasing him would make things go faster. But, well, we're in a hurry. Our friends are in trouble, and our teacher, Ombrick Salazar, believes you can help us. Catherine looked hopefully at him. The wizard from Atlantis, Bunnyman said, his ears now twitching. I had high hopes for that city, but then it vanished. He shook his head. I did what I could, but... Humans. Catherine wasn't sure how to answer this, but she had to keep him on subject. She tried to make her face express chargon at being a mere human, but then she pressed on. Can you help us get to the Earth's core from here? Impatience was bubbling up inside North. The light on his sword was blinking more and more frequently, which could only mean that they must be very close to the relic. Blast it, man rabbit! We need your help! We need the moon relic, and we need to get going. Will you help us or not? He demanded. Bunnyman sniffed. I'm neither a rabbit nor a man. I'm a puka. The name is Bunny Mund, E. Aster Bunny Mund, to be precise. He leaned forward and asked Catherine, What other chocolates would you care to try, human girl? North never liked being dismissed, and his temper was about to turn blistering, so Catherine jumped in before he could say anything more, trying to remain polite. It's not easy to choose, she said, trying to sound more confounded. The puka stared at her. She had to do something to make him like them. So she began to lick the last dustings of chocolate from her fingers. Bunnyman watched her closely. You do love my chocolate, he said. 
but then he looked rather glum. If only chocolate didn't... And then he stopped. Didn't what? Catherine encouraged. Bunnyman closed his eyes and breathed in. Alas, he sighed, chocolate is bad for pukas. Well, this is interesting, North thought. The puka surrounds himself with what tempts him the most. He gave Bunnyman an appreciating stare. Bad how? he asked. Bunnyman shot him a look. It makes me more like you. Illogical. Racing about. Always trying to save the day. He shook his head as if disgusted with himself. North began to object to the rabbit's tone, but Bunnyman turned his back to them and was now throwing open the door of a cabinet filled top to bottom with shelves of chocolate eggs. The display was dazzling. Catherine stopped him. You've been very generous, she said, but we'd be most grateful if you would let us borrow the relic and help us get to the Earth's core. Please. Oh, no, 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 the puka said, pulling out a tray of confections. My expertise is in chocolate. I don't get involved in human affairs. Not anymore. Untrue, said North. You stopped Umbrick from changing history when he went back in time. Twice. Indeed, but tampering in the past is not allowed for any living creature. Man, beast, plant, or egg. I've been watching that Umbrick of yours since he was a boy. He doesn't believe in the rules very much. Yes, agreed North, especially stupid ones. The rabbit didn't seem to like North's manner. Catherine shrewdly changed the subject. You know what Pitch did to the Golden Age? Don't you want to stop him from doing any more damage? Bunnyman shrugged. Humans come, humans go. They leave many relics. I've been on the planet much longer than humans have, and I will be here long after there are no more. Balderdash, said North. So you won't help us. My dear fellow, I didn't say I wouldn't help you, Bunnyman replied. I'm just not interested in helping you. North and Catherine did not know how to respond. Chapter 19 Nightlight is dimmed. Deeper below ground than any human had ever ventured, the children of Santoff Clausen hung in metal cages in the center of the earth. The cages, which hovered a few feet above the floor, were f freshly made just for them. The strange, swirling shapes of the hastily poured molten metal surrounded them was full of air holes and gaps, so the children, at least, could see out. There was much activity around them. Countless feelings were building and shaping innumerable lead weapons, armor plates, and shields. The children could hear Pitch's frenzied shouting of orders, and they looked repeatedly towards Nightlight's prison for reassurance. Just knowing he was nearby helped, which was the only comfort they had. Unlike their cages, Nightlight's prison was made of solid lead. There wasn't a window, there wasn't a crack, there wasn't a pinhole, and the door was sealed so tight no light could make its way inside. Nightlight lay on the floor of the cage. He did not move. His eyes were closed. His light grew dimmer with every passing minute. The lead seemed to be leeching all his brightness from him. But Nightlight was not alone. Something stirred under his jacket. And for a moment, Nightlight glowed brighter. Chapter 20 In which we find Munch Marks of Mystery Back in Santoff Clausen, Umbrick was slowly and carefully releasing prisoners of another sort, the residents of the village who were caught in Pitch's enslavement spell. It haunted him to see his beloved village, the focus of his long and brilliant life, frozen in a moment of struggle and terror. He began with Petrov, the bear and the spirit of the forest, for they would need to keep watch in case the fearlings were planning to attack again. As they stamped and roared and spun themselves awake, Umbrek told them the terrible news of the children's capture. Despair hung over them like a shroud. They had failed to protect the children from pitch. Umbrek urged them not to blame themselves. Even I once was caught by pitch in such a spell, he explained. Urgently, 
He told them that Pitch was holding the children hostage, and that the library was the ransom he demanded. None of them knew where the books had gone, so Ombrick moved on to release the owls and the other creatures in Big Root. They seemed the most likely to be able to help him solve the mystery. To each creature raised from Pitch's spell, Ombrick asked the same questions. What happened to the books in my library? Where are they? And each time he got the same answer. No one knew. But from the moonbeam, Ombrick had learned one important detail. His shelves were already empty when Pitch smashed into the library. Before she had left, Catherine had carefully gathered the pieces of Nightlight's shattered diamond dagger and placed them in a box. It was in this box where the moonbeam now rested. The poor little fellow seemed comforted to be with the diamond shards that had become his home, and Ombrick found himself wondering if the dagger could ever be repaired. It was the physical manifestation of the man in the moon's spirit and of Nightlight's courage, forged during that last great battle of the Golden Age. But now Ombrick knew that the dagger could not be used to hurt anyone, or anything good. That was why it had shattered when Pitch tried to kill Nightlight with it. Once all the creatures in Big Root were up and stretching, Ombrick headed outside. He had saved the parents for last. They had likely been unconscious while under Pitch's spell, so he would have to tell them that their children had been taken. The parents seemed to have just reached Big Root when Pitch had bewitched them, for that was where they lay, most of them on their sides or on their backs, where they had fallen when the Nightmare King turned them all into toys. Their china faces expressed dread and alarm, the only exception being Old Williams. Umbrick released him first, Old William contorting his lips again and again to get them moving. Then, as soon as he was able to speak, the father of all the Williams told Ombrick his story. I'm no swordsman, but I fought with all my might. We used Stardust bombs against him, but they did nothing. His cloak and sword sucked up all the light. He stormed Big Root, boasting that he was going to be more powerful wizard than you. Old William's voice cracked with desperation. Will I see my Williams again? he asked. Yes, Ombrick promised him. Old William walked with Ombrick as he moved from parent to parent, transforming them from tiny porcelain versions of themselves back into living, breathing human beings. And Ombrick told them to be brave, that their children had been taken hostage. He met the gaze of each and every parent, taking in their worried frowns and wishing he could ease their burdens. Nicholas St. North and Catherine are on their way to the Earth's core even now, he told them. I will do my utmost to find the books pitch covered, and when I do, they'll make the exchange. But I must know where the books are. But all the parents assured Ombrick that the children had been working on lessons in his library up until the moment Pitch's feelings had begun to seep into the enchanted forest. And yet all the books disappeared before Pitch could get to them, Ombrick mused, stroking his beard. The spirit of the forest hovered above him. He took pleasure in what he had done to us, she told him. He swaggered about, enjoying his handiwork. She began to weep tears of angry frustration. They hardened to emeralds and pearls that spilled uselessly to the ground, reminding her once again that her treasures were not what Pitch was after. Ombrick grew increasingly puzzled, and as soon as every living being in St. Clausen had been restored, he returned to his shattered library to investigate more diligently. The owls could remember nearly nothing, They'd seen a flash of light just as Nightlight rushed in. He made what looked like a protective shield around the children with it. Then Pitch's spell began to take hold of the owls, and everything had gone dark. Ombrick saw that bit of information as a clue. He plucked up one of the scraps of paper that littered the floor, turning it over and over. He held it up to the light, 
and noticed some funny little markings on one edge. He picked up another scrap, then another. They all had the same choppy shapes along one edge. Umbrick sat back in his chair, closed his eyes, and tried to remember where he had seen similar markings. Suddenly it hit him. Teeth marks, he exclaimed. Those are teeth marks. Chapter 21. The Excellent Exchange. Bunnyman's just not interested still hung in the air. The puka's nose twitched, and with a sharp twist of his staff, he disappeared. Catherine and North were alone. I think you made him mad, said Catherine. Who needs his help, North declared. Let's find that relic ourselves. Perhaps we can get us out of here and to the Earth's core. He let his sword lead them. Its blade pulled them through one egg-shaped chamber after another. The first few chambers were similar to the one they'd already been in, equipped for candy-making. One smelled curiously of cinnamon, and another of a sweetness so powerful and tempting they had to fight the urge to stop and inhale its trance-like perfection forever. But the next chamber they found themselves in was a curious kind of egg museum. There were shelves upon shelves of intricately crafted, jewel-encrusted eggs. North whistled. I know a Russian Tsar who would pay a fortune for some of these, he said appraising as the sword pulled him to yet another chamber. The next room, too, was a kind of museum, but the eggs here were natural. A bumpy yellow and orange shell labeled sea monster sat beside the green speckled egg of a mesopotamian dragon rows and rows of eggshells lined the walls ranging from the giant egg of a mega octopus pure white and bigger than north's head to the miniature ones of a hummingbird smaller than catherine's thumbnail there were chicken eggs and goose eggs, ducks' eggs and swan eggs, and even the tiny illuminated yellow eggs of a glowworm, barely the size of pinpricks. There were so many sizes and colors and patterns and speckles that these eggs seemed to Catherine to be even more beautiful than the eggs carved of gold and jewels. Then North let out a long, slow whistle. Catherine ran to the next room. Inside was just a single egg. It sat on a podium of gleaming silver. The egg looked as if it was made of the same mysterious metal as North's sword, and was covered in gorgeously wrought carvings of suns and moons and stars. At its center was a crescent moon that glowed with the same intensity as the orb on the magic sword. In fact, the egg and the sword seemed to be reaching for each other. That's it, North cried out triumphantly. That's the relic. He raced forward, reaching out to snatch up the egg. But before he could get his hand on it, he found himself being hurled across the room. He landed against the wall, his head pounding. When he could focus again, Bunnymond was standing over him. Naughty, naughty, he said. North jumped to his feet, rubbing the back of his head. Did you do that? he shouted. Bunnyman again went so still that he didn't appear to be breathing. Then his nose twitched. Catherine sensed a fight coming on. So, it seemed, did the warrior eggs. A mass of them trotted into the chamber on their tiny legs, bows again at the ready. Catherine ran over to stand between North and the puka. That egg does not belong to you, the rabbit told North firmly. North clenched his teeth to keep from yelling. Don't get your whiskers in a twist, man bunny, he said. I doubt you even know the power and significance of that precious egg of yours. That it was fashioned by people, not by rabbits or pukas, but humans from an age more grand than you can imagine and that it was intended for the purposes of good and honor and bravery, not to be used as some useless bauble that satisfies your punny whims of your precious collection. It was clear that North's argument had a powerful effect on Bunnymond. The rabbit stepped closer. He then stood ramrod straight, 
while his nose and whiskers twitched and stilled. Twitched and stilled. The twitches were soon as fast and blurred as the wings of a hummingbird in flight. Then the puka spoke very calmly and firmly. I know the egg's powers and its origins quite well, Mr. North. I, in fact, helped make it. He paused for a moment, letting North absorb that information. He drew himself taller, adding, Inside its curved shell is the purest light in all creation, light from the exact beginning of time. It is the light that all pukas were sworn to wield and protect, but men, people, cannot be trusted with it. We tried once, during the Golden Age. Fine! Then you must help us stop Pitch, North pressed. He killed the Golden Age. He is a creature, a monster, but... Bunnyman interrupted. He was first a man. North was not ready with a fast retort, but the puka raised his hand as if he were and continued. Pukas were the gatherers of this light. We brought it to worlds that we felt were ready for its power. We thought that the people of the Golden Age showed the most promise of all, and they used it well. But then Pitch came. He destroyed everything. He is why I am the last of my kind. I came here with the hope of a new Golden Age. He fixed North with a stare. That is why Star Lunar, the man in the moon's father, sent this relic, as you call it, to me. And since it has been in my possession, I've tried over and over to help the world of humans. I've invented most of your trees, flowers, grass, spring, jokes, summer vacations, recess, chocolate. But none of it seems to have changed anything. Humans still behave badly and have never seemed to cherish the light. A look that could only be described as forlorn crossed the puka's face, and his voice grew solemn. Man cannot be trusted. All that you invented, all of it, will be lost if Pitch has his way, argued North. He'll drain all the light of the world. Can you let that happen? Bunnyman seemed to think about that for a moment. Pitch and his fearlings don't even like chocolate. Or eggs, Catherine added. She wasn't sure if that was true, but it sounded good. Bunnymond was deeply disturbed by that remark. He puzzled and puzzled. The egg warriors seemed unsure. They lowered their weapons a few inches. Finally, the rabbit spoke. The fiends. Not like chocolate. Not like, he gasped, eggs? Now won't you please stop talking? You humans use many, many words, and so few of them are about eggs. It's exhausting. Bunnyman eased the relic from its shimmering stand and held it aloft. I will return in approximately one hour and seven minutes human time with your friends. I'm ready, North said. Let's go. Oh, no, 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 Bunnyman said. I work alone. Chapter 22 one mystery begrets another. Teeth marks, Ombrick said again. But whose teeth marks? His beard twirled as he pondered. His exclamation echoed throughout the village. The creatures of the forest, bristling with pent-up energy after having been trapped as toys for so long, joined forces to help Ombrick search for clues. Dragonflies and moths flew through every inch of the forest, Spiders and ants crawled into every hidden nook in Big Root. Birds and squirrels checked the treetops. The parents, too, joined the search, combing through every home, every yard, upending mattresses and vegetable gardens. Ombrick examined the gnawed pieces of book paper with his microscope. Who would eat my books? Nightlight had some hand in it, I'm sure, but what? He wondered. He pressed his fingers to its temples, not wanting to admit it, but his last journey through time had taken a great toll on him. 
The long, slow process of releasing the entire village from Pitch's spell had added to his weariness. For the first time in his very long life, Ombrick felt not old, but ancient. But he couldn't wallow in this unfamiliar feeling. The children needed him, old or not. So he shook away his fatigue and examined the paper scraps again. Mr. Query would never allow. Ombrick stopped in mid-sentence. His eyebrows, beard, mustache, hair, shoes, and even eyelashes began to twirl. Mr. Query! Ombrick shouted, leaping up. Mr. Query! Mr. Query! He hadn't seen the glowworm since he returned to the village. And now he knew the reason. Mr. Query has eaten my books to keep them out of Pitch's hands. First things first, he remembered why the owls had said, they saw a flash of light before everything had gone dark. Umbrick opened the box where the moonbeam rested and asked, Was Nightlight holding anything when Pitch took him away? The moonbeam sensed Umbrick's excitement and grew stronger himself and glowed, Yes. Was it white, rather oblong, about the size of my hand? The moonbeam pulsed twice. That's it, Umbrick said, sitting back with a knowing nod. Mr. Quarry ate the books, then he wrapped himself in a cocoon. Nightlight's flash of light protected the children and gave Mr. Query time to eat the books. The little fellow was always hungry for knowledge, but this is epic. Ombrick was almost laughing now. Nightlight took Mr. Query. He has him still. The library is in Mr. Query's stomach. The old wizard stroked his still twirling beard right under Pitch's nose. Chapter 23 The Honk of Destiny We will never know what furious argument might have followed Bunnyman's insistence that he go to the Earth's core without North and Catherine. For in the incredibly tense seconds after the Puka had made his declaration, Kalish came waddling into the chamber and honked loudly. They all three turned and looked at the goose, North with slight irritation, Catherine with concern, and Bunnyman with complete and total awe. Is this one of the great snow geese of the Himalayas? Bunnyman asked, his nose not twitching, but sort of rotating slowly in amazement. Yes, her name is Kalish, Catherine told him hesitantly, a little rattled by the rabbit's shift in interest. She thinks I'm her mother. I was there when she hatched. The puka inhaled deeply. Tell me everything, he insisted. Was the egg very beautiful? North fought his every impulse not to shake some sense into the strange long-eared creature. Time was tumbling by and the rabbit wanted to talk about eggs. But North's calmer self sensed an opportunity. Tell him about the blasted egg, he said, motioning to Catherine to hurry. Catherine put an arm around Kalish's slender neck. Well, her egg was large and silvery with swirls of pebble-sized bumps that glistened like diamonds and opals, she said. As I always imagined it. Come, Bunnyman said, pointing to his egg museum. One of the shelves had an empty space labeled Himalayan Great Snow Goose. It's the one egg I don't have. My collection is not complete, he stared at Catherine. It's silvery, you say. Silvery and blue. Catherine elaborated. The puka could scarcely contain himself. Kalish would be grateful to anyone who did as we asked, Catherine said. The puka was almost quivering. After a long moment, his former reserve seemed to return. His nose twitched. Then he spoke. My army is already assembled. I am at the ready, as I hope you are. Any friends of the great snow geese are friends of mine. Come this way. We will take tunnel number 1728. He paused dramatically, then added with a flourish, Straight to the Earth's core! Finally, North grumbled, placing his hand on the hilt of his magic sword. The weapon began to glow. Bunnyman's egg relic did the same. Chapter 24 In which there is a fearful discovery and a whisper of hope. 
To the children's great relief, Pitch and the Fearlings had disappeared into another chamber. The chamber where they were kept was as wide and as tall as Big Root, but it was nothing like Big Root. This was a dark and fretful place. If Big Root was a treasure chest of wonders, Pitch's lair at the Earth's core was like the fabled box of Pandora, filled with doom and darkness. The children had managed to ever so quietly wiggle through the openings in their cages and climb down. Half a dozen tunnels led out from the chamber, but Tall William and Petter had explored and reported that everyone was being guarded by fearlings. Not that it mattered. The children wouldn't try to escape without nightlight. Fog, Petter, and Sasha stood watch while Tall William ran his hands over the the door of Nightlight's cage, seeking a knob, a keyhole, anything that would help them free their friend. But there was nothing, not even a crack. Whatever dark magic Pitch had used when he removed his sword from the lock had left the door smoother than fresh ice on the skating pond in Santoff Clausen. Tall William knocked hard to let Nightlight know he was there, then placed his ear against the cage. Did he hear you? Sasha asked, putting her own ear against the metal. Did he knock back? Tall William shook his head. I don't think so, but it's hard to hear anything with all that banging going on. That banging was an incessant clamor. Clanking, hammering, striking, coming from the next chamber. Every now and again, it was peppered by the Nightmare King's booming laugh. What do you think Pitch is up to? Petter whispered. Let's find out, Tall William whispered back. They crept stealthily to the entrance of the next chamber and peered around the wall, just out of sight of the fearling guards. What they saw made their eyes go wide. Hundreds of fearlings were working furiously under Pitch's direction. Some were chipping away at the lead walls, making the room larger, dropping the lead chips into a bucket. Other feelings melted buckets of lead over an eerie blue lava. When the lead melted into a sticky liquid, they poured the mixture into molds. Tall William watched uneasily. Something was different about those feelings. They seemed more solid, less shadowy than the others. One of them tested the lead into the mold with a thin rod. It was solid now, and the feeling popped what looked like a heavy vest out of the mold and then handed it to the creature next to him. They passed it one down the line until it reached a feeling that looked normal, or at least what Tall William and the others had come to think of as normal. The creature slipped the object over his shadowy body, then he, too, took on the more solid look of the others and skulked into the light. They're making armor, Tall William breathed out. Petter stared hard. It covers them completely. Now they'll be able to go out in the sunlight, whispered Tall William, struggling to keep the dread out of his voice. Then they saw rows of swords and spears being fashioned in from the same liquid. Like Pitch's sword, Petter hissed. They crept back to the others and reported what they had seen. The smaller children just stared after hearing this alarming news. The smallest William hid his head under Fogs's arm. Sasha drew a deep breath to keep her voice steady, then said, I wish Ombrick and the others would hurry. Tall William tried hard not to seem scared, but he was. The feelings will be too strong for them now. With that armor and those weapons, he said quietly. Petter grew serious. And if they bring Ombrick's library, Pitch will know all the magic there is, he said. He'll be unstoppable. But we mustn't be afraid, he added, trying to convince himself as well as the others. It only makes Pitch stronger. The children knew he was right, but it was getting very hard to stay brave. If they'd only been able to hear the conversation that was taking place inside Nightlight's tiny cramped cage, 
Nightlight was listening to the muffled voice of Mr. Query. The cocoon shifted and wriggled under his jacket. Change is coming, said the valiant little worm, and it cannot be stopped. And Nightlight brightened. Chapter 25 The Egg Armada If there are seven wonders of the known world, Bunnyman's tunnel to the Earth's core would be the first of the unknown world. It was shaped like an egg standing on end and seemed to go on forever. North was intrigued by how quietly the Puka's train was traveling. Despite the remarkable speed, the train barely made a sound, just a quiet sort of clucking noise. He'd have to ask how the Puka managed that. Even the mechanical gin had emitted squeaks and hums. And though Catherine was increasingly worried about Nightlight and her friends, she couldn't help but notice how enticingly strange everything about Bunnyman's convoyance was. The railroad cars that were whisking them deeper and deeper underground were of course egg-shaped, as was virtually every knob, hinge, door, window, light fixture, and mechanical component. It was even more opulent than the llama's flying tower. Plus, the cars immediately behind her held an imposing army of well-armored warrior eggs, wielding an impressive array of weaponry. The smallest eggs were the size of a common chicken's egg, while platoons of other eggs were nearly as big as a good-sized suitcase, and a surprising number of eggs were huge, more than ten feet tall. Catherine was very interested in what those eggs could have come from. North, on the other hand, was having a difficult time taking these warrior eggs seriously. They're eggs, he thought to himself. Eggs! But he tried not to betray his doubts and instead asked his host in a tone that was at least hinted at politeness. Very pretty eggs, Bunnymund, but can they fight? The puka regarded him evenly, his nose not even twitching. The Greeks thought so at Troy, he replied, sounding a bit bored. Though why they built that clumsy horse instead of an egg, as I suggested, I'll never understand. Catherine, sensing another potential argument brewing, thought at it best to interrupt. Are we getting close? she asked. At our current rate of speed, we'll be there in exactly 37 clocks. Bunnyman replied. Clocks? North and Catherine both wondered, then decided not to ask any more questions for a while. Bunnyman's answers always left them feeling, well, they just weren't sure. Bewildered? Uncertain? Odd? Doomed? Meanwhile, Bunnyman regarded the two humans. He found himself concerned for them. But why? Here was this headstrong young man so determined to be daring, and the little girl worrying about her friends. Even that lovely goose was all a twitter about the danger the girl faced. So much disorder and upheaval. Still, he had to admit that there was a certain satisfaction in working with others, even humans. Never would he acknowledge that out loud, of course. But the puka had been alone for so many, many years. Having these other creatures about presented a change of pace. The girl did have excellent taste in chocolates, and there was something to be said for an adventure. And for what was this if not an adventure? Bunnyman's musings were interrupted by an insistent clanging sound, far off at the moment, but growing louder and closer as his train barreled forward. We are very nearly there, he told the others. Catherine could tell, for she could smell the dank, sulfury odor of fearlings. She held her dagger tighter. At the same time, North's sword and Bunnyman's staff both began to glow. Danger was apparently just ahead. Chapter 26 The Now Rotten Core Bunnyman ordered the train to stop, and it did so as smoothly as a duck landing on a pond. He, North, and Catherine made their way to the engine car at the front to better see what was ahead. Engineer eggs were still stoking the egg-shaped boiler of 
the idling engine with egg-shaped lumps of coal. They occur naturally, explained Bunnyman, before Catherine could even ask a question. Egg-shaped coal is where diamonds come from. Catherine liked knowing that, but North found the information distracting. Eggs, he grossed. You talk too much about eggs. Bunnyman was offended. I do not. You do too. I do not. Yes, you do. Do not do too. Catherine sighed. Here they were, the oldest and wisest creature on earth, and the greatest warrior wizard of the age, yet they were behaving like a pair of brats. She had been waiting for something like this to happen between them. They had been aching for a fight since they'd met. Truth be told, she'd expected something more mature from them both. Grown-ups, wizards, and pukas? Are they all this muddled? she wondered. As the do-nots and do-twos continued unabated, Catherine made a decision. She would ignore them both. She turned to Kalish and told her to go to the back of the train and stay quiet. The gosling honked sadly, but Catherine insisted. As Kalish waddled back to the passenger cars, Catherine climbed down from the engine and walked down the tunnel. It was very dim. The walls of the tunnel grew less smooth and crafted. The egg-shaped lanterns that had been affixed to the ceiling for the whole length of the passageway thus far now appeared less and less frequently. As she continued forward, she could barely make out where the tracks ended. The light of the lantern ahead of her, the last one she could see, was mistier than the others had been. Its shine hit in odd directions. Catherine paused, trying to sort out why that was so. The ominous clanking they'd heard earlier grew louder and louder. She could feel the reverberations. But she continued forward until she stood under the lantern and its strange glow. The light looked as if it was being blown in the wind. She followed its fading glow as it twisted farther away. But towards what? She took a few more steps forward, following the light. And with each step... The tunnel grew wider and taller, immense in fact. And then, to her complete surprise, it stopped. Just stopped. A gray vastness loomed in front of her, a giant wall that blocked her from going any further. But it didn't stop the light. Catherine could see that the misty stream of lantern light was actually flowing into this wall of dense, dark, metallic-looking rock. And then she knew. She was at the Earth's core. She approached the wall cautiously, her dagger at the ready. It occurred to her that her weapon couldn't possibly be much use against a wall, but perhaps it could defend against what was on the other side of the wall. So she kept her dagger raised, and she listened intently. The sounds from within were deep and menacing, like growling thunder from an approaching storm. She heard what she thought was laughing. Laughing? Could that be possible? Then she realized it was Pitch's laugh. A cold shiver ran through her soul. Catherine reached into her coat pocket and pulled out the locket she had gotten from Umbrick. She looked at the picture of Pitch's daughter. Again, she felt a strange sort of sadness. She had lost her father before she'd ever really known him, and yet she missed him every day. Their time together had been so brief, but the bond lived on. She knew it would never fade or die. She studied the picture of the long-ago little girl and wondered, might this locket be a much more powerful weapon against pitch than any dagger? Then, a shift in the lantern's light caught her attention. The light was changing, twisting down and splintering into different threads, fanning out like a web that arched behind her. She spun around. Surrounding her stood a dozen or so fearlings. The tendrils of lantern light fed directly into their leaded armor. North! 
Catherine managed to scream before they whisked her away to the awful place behind the wall. Chapter 27 The Power of the Inner Puka Remember, North was saying, glowering at Bunnymond, Pitch is mine. The Puka's nose twitched. Then they heard Catherine scream. North didn't wait for Bunnymen to respond. He turned on his heels and ran, his sword leading the way as if it couldn't wait to do battle. A knot of feelings plunged down at him. He could tell at a glance that they were more formidable than any feelings he'd seen before. They looked denser somehow, and though his sword was glowing far more brightly than usual, its light seemed to be sucked into the feelings themselves. North was startled, but the hilt of the sword wrapped itself tightly around his hand and gave him courage. He literally felt himself becoming stronger, faster. He slashed at the marauders as they descended upon him. He had expected them to vanish with one quick touch, but they did not. Instead, he heard the clank of metal against metal as he struck the fearlings and realized that they were armored. Like the knights of old, but deformed, tangled, and terrible. And armed. How could that be? North managed to think as he lashed out again and again, barely able to stop the fearlings' heavy swords from carving him up as they swooped down at him like giant, murderous bats. They swerved in midair to attack again. North willed himself to be stronger and faster still. And as he did, the sword responded. When the fearlings dove at him again, he sliced them down with swift and brutal precision. Their armor hacked open, the feelings vanished into nothingness. The empty armor fell to the tunnel floor like hunks from a broken coffin. North gripped his sword and stood ready for the next onslaught, but none came. In the tense quiet, he had time to think one terrible thought. What has happened to Catherine? The sword seemed to respond, for from its hilt a small oval mirror emerged. At first, North only saw his own face and Bunnymond, his army racing from the train behind him. Then, the mirror showed another image, blurry at first, then sharper. It was Catherine, surrounded by fearlings. Then it shifted to the face of Pitch as he looked down at her. The image faded and the mirror grew dark, reflecting nothing. North gripped his sword so intently he began to shake. This is my fault, he thought. He'd dropped his guard, let himself become distracted by what? By a candy-making rabbit. Bunnyman came up just behind North. Puka's had an uncanny ability to sense what others think and feel. He knew that North thought he was a silly creature. Ridiculous, even. But that didn't bother him. He could also sense North's anger and determination, his need to help his young friend. The rabbit had kept his distance from the tumultuous feelings of living things for centuries, but now he knew he must respond as he would have in the days of old. He put his paw on North's shoulder in as friendly a way as a puka can. Then he sighed deeply. Dear fellow, he said to North, this will be more difficult than I had imagined. Drastic measures are required. He reached into his robe and pulled out three chocolate eggs. This is no time for sweets, North snapped in frustration. For you, perhaps, said the rabbit. Then he popped the three chocolates into his mouth. The egg army gasped in almost perfect unison. None of them had ever seen Bunnymund eat a chocolate. They had only heard rumors of what happened when Pukas ate the substance. There was a curious rumbling, and North turned around to face Bunnymond. The rabbit appeared to be growing before his eyes, becoming huge, then hulking, like a warrior from a mythology not yet written. Bunnymond raised his egg-tipped staff above his head and let out a yell that shook the tunnel like an earthquake. The army of eggs did likewise. The sound was unlike anything North had ever heard. It was the first time in a thousand years 
that the world had heard the Pukin war cry, and even Nicholas St. North was impressed. Chapter 28. The Battle Begins. Pitch had almost no time to rel relish the capture of Catherine. He knew that if the girl was here, North and Ombrick must be near, and the magic library close at hand. But moments after the feelings had brought the girl to him, he heard that extraordinary, otherworldly sound. He alone, among all the creatures living, had heard that war cry before. It was a sound he'd hoped to never hear again. He remembered it from the time he'd destroyed the Pukin Brotherhood. It was the one battle of the Golden Age that he'd nearly lost. They've got a Puka with them? He hissed in alarm. He knew he must act quickly. Make ready, he bellowed to his feeling army. The battle begins! The feelings gathered with an enviable swiftness. Armor ready, weapons raised. They were a force no one would wish to face. Pitch grabbed Catherine by the collar and dragged her with him. Come, Sprite, he muttered. I have no time to dally with you just now. He rushed from chamber to chamber, shouting commands, making sure his dark army was in place and ready, and all the while Catherine dangled at his side like a sack. She watched every movement of the fearling troops, which was no easy feat as she was being buffeted about with Pitch's grim grip tight at her neck. But she could see the trap that Pitch was planning. The fearlings would let North and Bunnyman make their way deep into the hollow of the Earth's core, then surround and overwhelm them. Her mind raced. As Pitch planned to destroy her friends, she plotted how best to stop him. The Pukin war cry grew louder and closer. The Egg Army had obviously made it through the wall of lead that surrounded Pitch's lair. Time was short. Catherine had so few choices, and none played in her favor. But then, as Pitch was hurrying into another chamber, she saw the metal cages holding the f children, her friends. They'd crawled back up into the cages to avoid detection by Pitch, but Tall William and the others could see her very well. They yelled and stuck their hands out through the air holds to wave. She tried to shout back, but Pitch swung her suddenly to his other hand. As he did so, she noticed, only for an instant, that this hand seemed different, changed, almost human-looking. Then she heard the opening of a metal door, and she was shoved into a small room. The door slammed behind her. She was immersed in a darkness that was total and complete. And though he did not know it, Pitch had put her in the one place where she was most needed to be. Chapter 29. The Voice Ombrick had been furiously preparing for his trip to the Earth's core. From the moment he'd figured out what happened to his library and Mr. Query's role in its disappearance, he'd worked non-stop to make a perfect reproduction of it. Every single book, every single history, calculation, chart, map, mixture, blueprint, plan, and spell that had been duplicated and set down. The entire village had been busy binding the text that Ombrick had dictated to the owls, who were brilliantly adept at writing and drawing with both talons at the same time. It was fortunate that Ombrick could call upon his unmatched memory to recite the entire trove of his knowledge. When the last volume was stitched and bound, Ombrick stood back to take in the whole of it. It looked as if his library had never been touched. It looked perfect, but it was all bogus. There were flaws carefully crafted into each bit of information. Because of Ombrick's perfect memory, he knew exactly where to make a change here, a switch there. If followed to the letter, not one spell in this entire fabrication would work. Ombrick had no idea what form the real library was in since Mr. Query had bravely devoured it. The wizard was impressed by this brilliant bit of strategy on Mr. Query's and Nightlight's part, but he had to make certain that Pitch did not get the real library. The phony one would have 
to be used to trick the villain. This had been an extremely exhausting task, and he still had to muster the energy to astrally project himself and the immense library all the way to the center of the earth. He sat in his favorite chair, thinking about his store of knowledge, remembering it had been both satisfying and bittersweet. He felt as though he had relived the entire arc of his life. He remembered learning each and every bit of magic, where he'd been, who he'd been with at the time. He realized he'd achieved a rich, wild, vivid life. He had lived as he had believed. He had seen and known more wonder than almost any mortal ever had. So he felt a weary satisfaction. He would just need to rest his mind for a while. Ombrick leaned back and tugged at his beard, the owls watching him worriedly. They had never seen their master so tired, so frail. Ombrick's breathing became quiet and rhythmic, and he drifted into a deep sleep. He dreamed of when he was just a child in the city of Atlantis. There had been a day in his childhood that had always baffled him. It was the day of his first magic, and now he seemed to be reliving it. He hadn't been much younger than the youngest William, and had been secretly listening to the lessons of the older children. He had heard knowledge he was not yet supposed to know. He learned the secret of how to make a daydream come true. The young Ombrick stood in an open field and started to recite the spell. It was a difficult enchantment and required great concentration, but he was a boy with a talent for concentration. He focused hard till his mind was clear of all distraction. He chanted the words slowly and thoughtfully. Ombrick had always daydreamed of flying, and after a time he started drifting upwards, at first just grazing the top of the tall green field grass then higher, and finally up into the sky. He flew in and around clouds, soaring and spiraling like a fantastic sort of bird. But he had gone too fast and flown too high. His young mind grew tired. He could no longer maintain the spell, and he began to fall. Fear took over his thinking as he plummeted to the ground. He knew he must stop being afraid and focus on the spell, but his pulse was pounding and panic set in. He began to tumble uncontrollably, spiraling end over end with sickening speed. Everything was a terrifying blur. He fell so fast he began to black out, and he was glad. He couldn't stand to feel a terror this total, and he didn't want to face the instant that was coming, the moment when he would smash to the ground and be no more. As he began to lose consciousness, he felt a strange sort of calm, an acceptance of what would happen. Then he heard a voice whisper to him, I believe, I believe, I believe. It was a pleasant voice, one he did not recognize, but at the same time it sounded familiar, and he no longer felt afraid. Then, as it all went black, he knew, knew. Everything would be all right. And it was. He opened his young eyes some time later. He was in the same green field. He was not hurt. Not a scratch or a bruise was on him. Only his red hair was tousled. Ombrook never knew how he had survived or who had spoken the magic words to him. But on that day, he had learned the power of fear. That fear was an enemy that must always be conquered. Then, the memory ended, but the dream went on. Ombrick now saw himself in that same field from childhood. He was not a boy anymore, but very old. He lay in the soft green grass. It was so cool and comfortable. There was a soothing breeze, and the sky above was alive with white clouds that drifted by like great galleons. I am so tired. Maybe I will just stay here forever, he thought. It is peaceful. But now he heard the words again, echoing from far away. 
but this time the voice was different. It was a young girl's voice. He struggled to sit up, and as he did, he saw Catherine standing near him. Then North appeared next to her. They beckoned him to join them. They spoke, but he could not hear them. He could only hear the mysterious voice from long ago. I believe. I believe. I believe. Then suddenly, he woke up. He looked around his library, startled. He could still hear the voice, but only the owls were there. And for the second time, he felt the minds of Catherine and North reaching out to him. Their thoughts and his had become connected. He felt, no, he knew, that they were in grave danger, and he must act instantly. He grabbed the box that held Nightlight's moonbeam and the broken bits of the diamond dagger. Then he waved his staff over the new stacks of books. He felt strong again, young again, like the ombric in the days of yore. Could he project himself to the Earth's core? In an instant! And the books? Absolutely. His friends needed him. The peace he felt in his dream could come later. But that voice from the past, the voice that had saved him on that fateful day when he had first learned the glory and terror of magic, it sounded so familiar now. Who or what was it? Chapter 30 In which all is linked by an ancient mind trick that has a most surprising origin. North was dazzled. Bunnyman was a madman, or rabbit, or whatever. A dervish, a devil, a juggernaut. There simply wasn't a way to describe the puka's electrifying deeds. He had taken his relic and fixed it to the end of his staff, then aimed it at the lead wall that blocked their way. If this ancient lead had never seen sunlight, starlight, or any light other than lava light, it was seeing it now. The light that the relic contained blistered forth from a thousand tiny holes that opened up from its shell. This light would not be blocked or consumed. It could peel back the dense lead as smoothly as sealing wax from parchment. But still, North felt wary. It was almost too easy. The feelings kept retreating without putting up much of a fight. They were going deeper and deeper into the Earth's core, and the wavy, peculiar lead and lava landscape was hard to mark or remember. North prided himself on his stellar sense of direction, but now he felt uncertain about how to find his way back out, and his warrior instincts were telling him he was being pulled into an ambush. It was at just that moment that there came a sort of ringing in his ears. The sensation blocked out the clatter of battle around him. He looked to Bunnymund, and he knew that the puka was experiencing the same thing. The magic sword could feel it, 